episode 664. Book talk today begins at 13 minutes and 19 seconds. Emma begins with episode 649. Welcome to Craftlit, the podcast for crafters who love books. My name is Heather Ordover, and I'm podcasting from where the Delaware River meets the Old York Road, New Hope, Pennsylvania. Episode 664 OPTs. This episode of Craftlet is brought to you by you, those of you who are our lovely patrons at patreon.com slash craftlet and channel members at our YouTube craftlet dash channel. The people we would like to highlight this week are Cecilia Real, Shelly Mayer, Damon and Marna. Hi, Marna. BJ. Hi, BJ. And Rosa Caffey. Thank you so much for your support. This week in particular, I'm really excited about this episode, so thank you even that much more. Not that I'm not usually excited about our episodes, but I'm looking forward to this one. This one's got some teeth in it. Hello, how are you? I'm actually pretty darn good. I've had a good week since last we spoke. The last time that I recorded, I'd had good days up until then and went right back to bed and after that, I've really had a pretty good week. So my fingers are crossed that as I feel better, maybe my brain will come back online. That would be lovely. Because right now, the brain is still not back. But but that's okay. I'll take what I can get. I don't feel like I'm uh, on death's doorstep. So that's just great. I hope you too are feeling well yourself. Uh, today's episode is called OPTs because I am talking to you about other people's things. First off, we have our raffle. So in, in this case, the other person's thing that I am sharing are the lovely coaster sets that are made by Susan, listener Susan. And we have two. So if you are interested in being put into the running for one of these little packs of four coasters and two bookmarks, let me know because I've got two packs to send to very lucky people. So I'm very excited about that. The second other people's thing that I wanted to share with you is a bit of a story. So I made my first actual dress on Mildred. It did not take long at all. And this is being made with Jersey. And that means without, since I did the whole thing on Mildred, without a serger or an overlocker or even a zigzag stitch. That is how awesome the chain stitch machine, it's a different kind of stitch than a bobbin stitch because it's the vibrating shuttle that goes back and forth and basically uh, makes a locked chain stitch. It's really hard to unravel, which makes ripping out seems kind of a pain, but that's fine because that also means that it is kind of indestructible. So ridiculously easy to sew straight. I cannot recommend the Singer 27 highly enough. It's the simplest gear mechanisms. It's the simplest clean job, I think, because the 66 that came along with the treadle table is not an easy mechanism. It's much more advanced and complex. So I'm glad I started with the 27, but I'm also still just blown away at how straight this sucker stitch is. So I made myself this dress. I will link out to the the pattern as well in case you are interested. I found it by uh, stumbling on a, a YouTuber who called it her favorite dress ever. And I agree with her. Once you kind of grok how it works and if you do the stay stitching, super important since it's knit fabric. Wow, easy. I added an extra two panels, one on each side, and I added pockets. And for a knit dress, that seems kind of dicey. But it's really not. I think it fits better. It looks more like an A-line skirt instead of a straight skirt, which I appreciate. And as Helen Mirren said, it's the way to make your body look curvier in a better way than it may actually be. So I'm I'm all for that. I will take Helen Mirren's advice any day of the week when it comes to what to dress in. But I, I made myself this dress. And then I went to 
I went to Dollar Tree, you know, because you go to the dollar store. I am in the shampoo and conditioner aisle because I can get big tankards of conditioner. And this guy with a baseball cap and a big bushy beard and a lot of tattoos walks by me and says, what a beautiful dress. And he's probably like 35. And I went, oh, I just made it. And he said, no. And I said, yes, I did. I really did on a 117-year-old sewing machine. He's like, was it a singer? My grandmother used to have one of those. They sound so awesome. They click so beautifully. I'm like, oh my God, words that came out of my mouth just minutes ago. And we got to talking. And the reason I am sharing him is because as we're talking, another woman who was very scowly coming down the aisle towards us saw him talking to me. Big grin breaks out on her face. And she says, thank you so much for the basil. It smells so good. I cannot wait to get home. And he said, oh, I'm so glad you liked it. That's great. And he looks at me and says, I have basil in the back of my car. I just have a bunch of flats that I've been growing on my back porch. If you want some basil, I just like giving it out to people. I'm like, who are you? This guy's amazing. So as we're talking, I mentioned craft lit and people who work with their hands. And he said, oh, you mean like ADHD people who have to keep using their hands in order to remember things? And I'm that, yes. And he said, well, I'm that kind of person too. And he opens his phone and it's an iPhone 7. So this is not a spring chicken phone. And he starts showing me some of the photographs he's taken. Un believably beautiful. Like he he had one picture that has stuck in my mind. It was echinacea flower, a cone flower with a bumblebee on top of it. And it's an incredibly detailed close-up with the kind of bokeh effect where the the back is out of focus and the bee is in really sharp focus with the flower. And and he's like, yeah, I just used my iPhone 7 to take this picture. He said, I also have a regular camera, but usually I don't have that with me. So I just use the camera I've got. I have a iPhone 13. I can't take pictures that good. So clearly it's not the phone. It's not the camera. It's you. And he said, oh, that's very sweet. And he showed me his website and he gave me his little business card. So I am going to give you his contact information as far as uh, there's a QR code that you can follow, but there are also links. You can follow him on Instagram. And he has a little store online and he makes art. And clearly part of why he's making art is just to make people happy. And God, it just, it feels like it's been since COVID, like a social desert. And so just having the opportunity to meet a really nice stranger who does things to make people happier was a godsend. I don't know. Maybe that's why I feel good this week is just because of him. So I wanted to share that information with you, uh, share his information with you, just because I I hope somebody who's listening likes his stuff and buys something from him. And and if you do, tell him, Heather, who made the dress on the $117 sewing machine, or 117-year-old $20 sewing machine, sent you. Small world, weird world, good world. It's nice when it's a good world. The last two things that I wanted to share with you. Andrew's in between jobs right now, and one of the things that he has decided to do during that downtime is go back and find all of his plays, update the ones that needed updating that could be updated, then putting together dramas and uh, comedies and separating them out into two different volumes. And so now you can purchase his plays on Amazon. So we're going to have links out uh, his website and his playbooks as well. If you know any theater people, this is the benefit of having an Andrew around. If you know any theater people, please pass this on to them because, I mean, you know me, I've been with this guy forever and I'm obviously going to be biased, but he's the best writer I've ever known. If he had been gay, he would have been Tony Kushner. He's, his writing is extraordinarily good and his plays are beautiful and he writes really good women which is also just lovely. So the reason I bring it up is because Andrew is also accessible. So if you know somebody who is a drama teacher or runs a community theater and they're interested, Andrew has 
produced all of these plays as well. And some of them he's co-directed or just straight up directed himself. And as a consequence, these things have been workshopped quite extensively, which means they are solid. But it also means that Andrew is on deck if a drama teacher or independent production team has questions about the text or changes to be made to the text. You're not supposed to do that just on the fly. You're supposed to do the text as written. But that does not mean that Andrew isn't there to help. So I was really, really excited. He surprised me with that. I did not know that that's what he was up to and made me very happy. So there's that. And then the last thing is... Uh, if you remember years ago, and still occasionally, but not very occasionally, I do voices for Chilling Tales for Dark Nights. I I play all the women who are mothers for Chilling Tales stories. One of the people who I worked with the most extensively back in like 2017 was Jesse Cornett. Lovely guy. I loved working with him. He is a very, very talented uh, voice talent. And on his Facebook page, I just happened to see him post a GoFundMe for Bo. Bo is an eight-year-old kid who just got leukemia, just got diagnosed with leukemia. It's going to be six months of treatments and then two years of chemo. No kid should ever have to go through this. And I know we all have compassion fatigue because so many things are so screwy in the world right now. And it's really hard to care. Or maybe it's not hard to care. It's hard to feel like you're not constantly being broadsided by new things to be upset by and worried about and things like that. I just was watching Tom Nicholas's video, uh, his video on how Britain has become a poor country. And one of the saddest things that got said was, I don't know if you're old enough to remember back when Bush the first was president, he talked about a thousand points of light. They, they cut all of the social funding, saying that the thousand points of light were going to become clear in the country and all of the charities were going to take up working for uh, people who had social needs, whether that was child poverty or food shortages or extra support groups. It didn't really work very well. And I felt really bad because we have apparently exported that to England. So. I'm sorry, I didn't want that to happen to you. But it, it also made me think, you know, the being a thousand point of light when you know that it's not just you having to carry all of it is comforting. So if you have, you know, five bucks to send to Bo, this cute, adorable little kid, it's not Jesse's son, it's a Jesse's friend, their kid. It's just something that you could do for a stranger to make their life a little bit easier. And God knows, just like having this crazy guy at the Dollar Tree be so nice to me and, and perk up my day, that perking up lasted a long time. So smiling and being a point of light wherever one can be one is not a bad idea. So today's episode is long-ish, and that is because we're doing three chapters. They really need to all go together, but also there's a lot to front load and then a lot to clarify before we move on about the characterization that is exposed in today's chapters. So this may be a podcast that you need to break into chunks. The before chapter, the during the chapters, the post chapter, it may be good for three, three different listens. So book talk begins at 13 minutes and 19 seconds. The chapters themselves begin at 50 minutes, 37 seconds. And the post-chapter talks begin at one hour, 46 minutes, 56 seconds. So I hope that helps if you need to break things up a little bit. And who boy, is today a snark fest? So you're, last, last week, was it last week? I think last week was buckle up for baits. No, two weeks ago it was buckle up for baits. This week, it's buckle in for snark because wow, just wow. We have, we have a lot of fun. So we're doing volume two, chapters 14 and 15, or chapters 32 and 33, if you go straight through. There are several things to go over before we listen, just so that you get jokes and snide asides that Jane Austen is giving us. But also, many of these have extra layers that I don't want to spoil, so we will be revisiting some of them on the flip side. So if you think, wow, there must be more to that, it very well is likely, and I will tell you what I learned on the on the flip side. 
one of the first things to know before we dive into these chapters is terms of address. And we've talked about this off and on over the years, depending on the era that the books take place in that we've read. Certainly when Jane Austen was writing, it was Miss Bennett and Mr. Darcy, and they never call each other anything other than Miss Bennett and Mr. Darcy in Pride and Prejudice. He never calls her, well, not that's not true. I think he does call her Elizabeth like once, maybe twice. So two of the things that you never do, married couples are never supposed to speak of each other familiarly in polite society. Like I would never, if I were at a party or on an official visit, I would never refer to Andrew as Andrew. Andrew would be Mr. Ordover, which sounds so weird, but you know, there were rules and expectations and norms in society, and they're there for a reason. And if this, these two chapters don't explain why those reasons matter, nothing ever will. The second thing that you never do is you don't truncate that. So you don't call nightly nightly. You don't call Elton Elton. And you definitely don't call, like if Elizabeth Bennett called Mr. Darcy Mr. D in public, thinking that she's being so adorable and charming. She's not. She's just being tacky. So keep your ears open for things like that in today's chapter. There's going to be a lot of things where I'm going to wind up saying, keep your ears open for examples of this. And yeah, and it just insert snark explanation here. It also, the chapters today reminded me a hundred percent of the movie Anti Mame. And we're going to play a clip for you at the end today. I don't want to I don't want to spoil it, but I, I could not get the end of Auntie Mame out of my head when reading these chapters today. So if you've seen Auntie Mame, the Rosalind Russell Auntie Mame, oh, and I have a clip for you if you love Rosalind Russell. She was on What's My Line in 1953 or 54, I think, and she is absolutely hysterical. She's, oh my God, I just love real, Rosalind Russell so much. So in Auntie Mame, her adopted son, Patrick, is going to marry Gloria Upson. And their, their home in the Burbs in Darien, Connecticut, is called Ups and Downs. Sure. There is actually a street on one of the streets in here in, uh, in Pennsylvania that we drive by all the time. There is a family that has put out in front of their house a sign calling their country home ups and downs. And I'm always wondering, like, do they know about the anti mame Is this a reference to anti mame Because this isn't necessarily the house name that you would want to choose, or do they just think they're being clever? Which I suppose they, they are. But if you know the sub-referencing for anti mame this is why it always matters to know your sub-references. You might not want to name your, your home. You're back 40, the ups and downs. Which leads me to, there is a complex interplay that is going on in today's chapters between classy and tacky. And often that includes elaborating on and elucidating class structure. And I just want everyone to keep in mind that while, while the class structure is very clear in Emma, classiness is not restricted to old money. Emma would not be hanging out with Harriet if Harriet weren't classy. Mrs. Weston, a governess, not old money, but classy. So don't let yourself be swayed by how obviously this is going to feel like it's a class thing instead of a classy thing. It's classy versus tacky. And we're going to get into more of that in a minute. Going back to Annie Mame for a second. If you hear something that sounds like it's in italics, it is. There's a lot of italicizing for humor in these two chapters, especially the first chapter, which is the longer one of the two. And in, in Auntie Mame, it would just be like Gloria telling the story of like, well, you just can't imagine what happened with me and Bunny Bixler when we were playing in these semifinals. I mean, the absolute semifinals of the ping pong match at the club. All the words that sound like they have italics on them, that's what it's going to sound like in your ears today. So just know that Jane Austen was not, not being clear about 
where the verbal stress was being placed on words for both snotty effect and comedic effect. Along with the italicization of language, especially speech, but also Emma thinking speech, Emma thinking in her own head, speaking to herself. There's also a split between erudite speech, somebody who's just good at saying words, and being cliched, somebody who is relying on cliches, thinking that that is making them sound smarter or indicating that they're hip or connected or anything like that. There's a lot of that going on. And some of this is things that we just wouldn't pick up on anymore because either they're cliches we don't use anymore or we recognize them as cliched. But when we are looking at Jane Austen, something from 200 years ago, we might not necessarily recognize that it's a cliche. We may just think that's old speaking when in fact, no, it was actually already a cliche. So I'm going to make sure I point out those for you. So I've already dropped some of the hints that today's chapters have a lot to do with Mrs. Elton. And that means that we have all of the visiting that has to happen. And we know that 15 minutes is like the minimum to be polite. So keep in mind everything that we've talked about, about the social niceties of who pays visits to whom and when. And remember that being a bride is a big deal. And social visits to the bride were expected to be paid. Emma's going to refer to Mrs. Elton's person. That means her figure, her how she looks. And prepare yourself for some names that are, again, rather Dickensian in their style. Mrs. Elton's brother-in-law is Mr. Suckling. I'm not going to say anything more about that. <laughs> and she talks about Mr. Suckling's seat, which is his country estate. It, it's You can't do better than that. Mr. Suckling's seat. You're going to hear about Baruch Landau's we will put up a, a picture of a Baruch Landau. This is the kind of carriage that could seat four people, two facing back, two facing front. There was the, the front driver's seat in the front driving the horses, but it also had the adjustable tops so that you could put a top up over the people in the front and a top up over the people in the back to protect you from sun or sort of from rain, but it was very adjustable. So it would be very much like. Heather says meaningfully, having a T-top Trans Am in 1984, it's not necessarily a Porsche, but it's also not necessarily not a Porsche. But in this situation, I think it's it's probably very much more like a, tra not even a Mustang, a Trans Am. And, and not a Volkswagen Rabbit with a convertible top, which is very fun and perky. This was, especially if you have more than one of these, that would be conspicuous consumption. Some of the cliched words that you're going to hear, enchanted, charm, charming, those were already cliched terms when Jane Austen was writing. So if it's it's back to the Bunny Bixler, I'm charmed to meet you. It's just such an enchanting party. It's very much that already. An interesting phrase, an error so double-dyed, D-Y-E-D. If you double dye something, the color really sets in and is not going anywhere. So that's double dyed. So an error like that would be really ingrained. It's it's not going away. From what I am told by the annotations, and this actually jibes with something that we talked about, I think in Sense and Sensibility or North and South and maybe even War of the Worlds. No, I don't think so. Anyway, Kent lovely part of Britain. A lot of TV shows and, and movies get filmed in Kent. It's gorgeous. It is also apparently referred to as the Garden of England, that county, County Kent. That makes it sound Irish. It's not. It's Kent. Surrey, which is where they are, is very pretty, but not Kent. So just keep that in mind. Kings Weston. This is hyphenated. Kings, K-I-N-G apostrophe S dash Weston, was a grand home and estate just outside of Bristol. Um, I think it is still there and visitable, but it was 
either just finished in its construction or being finished. Oh no, I lied. And at the the point that Emma takes place, it's about a hundred years old. So it's been around for a while and it's well known and people go visit it. Um, kind of like how Pemberley gave tours to the the grounds and parts of the home. Be the same here. With her own goodwill is like being left to her own devices. If she left something to her own goodwill, she would was leaving it to her own decisions and planning. Uh, the park paling, paling being posts and boundaries. We've talked about baths so often. The history of baths, waters, medicinally lauded waters goes way back to the Romans, to 43 AD, where the, when the Romans uh, established Bath as a bathing town with medicinal waters. But what I didn't know was that the first time it was really kind of cemented as a very much English thing was Geoffrey of Monmouth. So this was in 1136. He wrote that King Bladud, the father of King Lear, founded the city of Bath after being, quote unquote, cured of leprosy by the waters. And, you know, it keeps going. So you can hook up with some health, but you can also just hook up in Bath. And we can't forget that it is both of those things that has made Bath so popular during uh, Jane Austen's time. Along with Mr. Suckling, we have Mrs. Partridge, Mrs. Bird, Millman, M-I-L-M-A-N. So it's not quite as, as obvious as M-I-L-L-M-A-N, but it's still Millman. Just keep those, those in the back of your mind as being Dickensian style names. A formal introduction would be an introduction into polite society. Normally, it would be the person of the higher class strata within that society who is making the introductions, the assumption being that they had connections that could be beneficial for you. And so if you were someone they liked, they would want to expand those, uh, those networks to you and for you and with you. It would be very strange to have anyone of a lower societal level. It would be very weird to have someone lower than you on that scale to be trying to introduce you to good, I'm putting it in air quotes, people. There's a reference to somebody who just made a shift to live, like taking in borders to pay rent. It's just scraping by just to make a living and and not like a nice living, but just a living. You're, you're going to hear, I, and you know who is saying this, I am dotingly fond. I am passionately fond. This is, it's ever so grand and it just makes me marvel. This is, I'm dotingly fond, passionately fond. And that is exactly how Jane Austen meant it to be read. I mean, not with a bad Long Island lockjaw American accent, but that taint is on the way those words are supposed to come across. Mediocre, this is what's called macronic affectation. This is where mediocre is the, the word from French. And at this point, it was a, a word that had been used for a while in England, meaning what it actually means. It is in italics here, which probably indicates, because this is something that Austin does in several other places in, in Emma and other books of hers, it probably means that it was being pronounced in the French style to sound ever so awesome and just charming. But it was considered ostentatious and and just not done to overemphasize the the finishing school nature of knowing how to pronounce cliched terminology in the language that we borrowed it from. So that's a, a macronic uh, affectation. Macronic, a word I did not know before, is using words or inflections from one language and introducing those into the context of another language. So it's exactly what I said. This is a big deal. The usage obviously was higher at 1800 and it's gone down considerably since then. But it was early 17th century. And in, in that respect, it was referring kind of to a jumble or a, a medley of sounds and language. Almost, it's almost like Spanglish, that, that idea behind Spanglish, that it's, you're mixing a lot of stuff up together. And that is uh, Macronic. Mrs. Elton is going to mention that she is blessed with so many resources within myself. Wow. She's just capable of so much, you know. 
she is her own best friend and her own best advocate and doesn't recognize any, well, you'll see, she doesn't recognize anybody else in her sphere who is there as a support. She is the kind of person who would say that she got rich all on her own instead of, you know, noticing that the slave trade probably made up a lot of her money and that that was not her, that was not even her family doing the work. I mean, I know they can, it was a job and you got paid for it, but it's like, it's like that line in Hamilton. Hamilton says to Jefferson, when you're talking about states' rights, yeah, keep ranting. We know who's really doing the planting. It's that kind of thing. It's a little, a little tacky. She also says, uh, I condition for nothing else. I have no other stipulations. But without music, life would be a blank for me. So I, when she says condition, that's she's talking about like the conditions of an agreement, the stipulations of an agreement, which in this case would actually be getting married and the agreements, the arrangements that were made. I actually have written in the margins of my book, more shocked and appalled faces. I've drawn little, not smiley faces, but like big eyed, big mouth faces all over these chapters next to paragraphs. And I just realized just how many of them I have in here. Also with several WTF question mark, question mark, question marks in the margins as well. There's going to be several that will jump out at you and whack you upside the head. One of them that probably won't is this, cara sposo. So cara would be my, my heart, my love, sposo, my spouse. Cara, however, is the feminine. So if you're talking about caro sposo, you're talking about husband, caro, male, sposo. Cara would be your female version of that. It would be your wife. And Jane Austen doesn't do things like this by accident. So you will hear Mrs. Elton refer to Mr. Elton as my caro sposo. She is not only using a phrase that was horribly cliched already, but also she's saying it wrong. And that's one of the things that we'll talk about more on the flip side. Mr. <laughs> Mr. Woodhouse, I start laughing every time I mention his name. Mr. Woodhouse at one point is talking to Emma about Mrs. Elton. And after he says his piece, he says, but I believe I am nice. And what he means is, I believe I'm being mm, nice, like uncomfortable nice, like a little too precious, a little too fussy. It's like he recognizes that in himself from time to time and, and he kind of hears himself speaking. And I, I thought that was actually kind of a lovely way to own, I know I'm being a pain in the butt. It's I'm being nice. Nice. The way that Sondheim uses in the witch's song, you're so nice. You're not good. You're not bad. You're just nice. Oh, Sondheim. He also says he does not like the corner into Vicarage Lane. So thinking back to the Bruce Landau, I am sure that this is like, James is taking this corner at an incredibly slow walk, but whatever lurching or leaning that the carriage does on the turn into Vicarage Lane just does not sit well with Mr. Woodhouse. There is no speed that is safe for him except walking, which he wouldn't do anyway. There's a, a phrase used by Emma that I think I'm, I'm going to start using. Vanity baits. B-A-I-T-S, like fish bait. A vanity bait for poor young ladies. This is uh, something that was would be a, an incentive for you to be vain about yourself and giving you an opportunity to be vain about yourself. I love that. Vanity bait. Yeah. There's clickbait and there's vanity bait. In the close to the beginning of volume two, chapter 15 or chapter 33, there is a long statement that I found very confusing. I had to go back in and really dig on this one. Emma is feeling uncomfortable about Mr. and Mrs. Elton. The sensations which could prompt such behavior sunk them both very much. It diminished her attitude of them. They, it sunk in her esteem. It was not to be doubted that poor Harriet's attachment had been an offering to conjugal unreserve, something that Mr. Elton told Mrs. Elton privately was about the whole Emma Harriet debacle, which means Mrs. Elton is not going to be predisposed to like either. Emma or Harriet. And that is something you'll be picking up on 
way through the chapters today. And I think really it's important to to know that even though Jane Austen was not married and and didn't have a lot of close people around her aside from her her parents, she had brother, I mean brothers who were married, so she had sisters and laws and nieces and nephews, but she wasn't really she didn't live in anybody else's home, not for very long, where there was any other married relationship other than her parents. She still understood how husbands and wives might communicate with each other privately and the kinds of things that would be, I'm, I'm telling you this personal thing about me as a way to create a sense of we're in this together. We circle the wagons around each other. We take care of our family. We protect each other. The phrase without solicitation or plea or privilege, it's without being asked to, without any social right to do so and under no obligation to do so. So without any solicitation or plea or privilege, this is not your business. Stay out of my business. Mrs. Elton thinks of herself as a knight errant. E-R-R-A-N-T. This is like chivalrous. She's thinking that she is being chivalric and incredibly helpful and all of that. And she is just not. You will hear Mrs. Elton say, I quite rave about Jane Fairfax. First of all, you don't call her Jane Fairfax. She'd be Miss Fairfax. But the other thing is rave was was already cliched, which means that it had already sort of, it started as slang a while back and it has gotten so ingrained in the language of the day that it is it may have started as slang but now it is cliched it's it's already gone to the other end of the spectrum so again it's ever so marvelous ever so charming he just makes me marvel warmth is enthusiasm you will laugh at my warmth my enthusiasm not like warmth red face embarrassed but enthusiasm and you are going to hear Mrs. Elton misquote, misquote Thomas Gray's elegy written in a country churchyard. And just really briefly, this is, this is one of those times where Jane Austen is not doing this on accident. This is actually character information. The whole thing about the elegy is walking through a country graveyard, you see all these graves of people who were loved and beloved and are now no longer with us. And once you're dead, it doesn't matter if you were Einstein or a cleaning lady. You're the same in death, but that also means that in life you were too. And how we rank people as a, a level of importance is kind of, you can't take it with you, so stop. And the way it's said in the poem, so this is the actual poem, full many a gem of purest ray serene the dark unfathomed caves of ocean bear. So dark caves, no light. There are still amazingly rare and beautiful gems in there. Or full many a flower is born to blush unseen and waste its sweetness on the desert air. Just because the flower is growing all alone in the desert, far away from everybody else, doesn't mean that that sweetness is diminished at all. And it is sweetness on the air. And this is what's important. Because when Mrs. Elton misquotes it, she says fragrance. And fragrance is fake. Right? I know. So, I'm just saying. I'm saying Jane Austen is a genius is what I'm saying. Uh, right, W-R-I-G-H-T, is Mrs. Elton's cook. It's going to come up. Jane Fairfax will be referred to as in the first style of guileless simplicity and warmth. Her manner is easygoing. And we know that is not true of Jane Fairfax all the time. She can be fairly rigid and uncomfortable and very, very reserved. But in this scene, she is easygoing. She's courteous. She's compliant. She's easy to talk to. And, and it's worthy of note because that's not always normal for her. At one point, Emma is going to be horrified looking at Jane Fairfax and saying, now she's choosing the mortification of Mrs. Elton's notice and the penury of her conversation, penury being the, the poverty, the poorness of her conversation. She's not a great conversationalist. And here Jane Fort Fairfax is having to spend a lot of time with her. That bites. Also, don't forget that we started in winter 
Originally, the Campbell Dixons were going to be gone for three months and then come back from Ireland. So when you hear that they have decided to stay until midsummer, it's another roughly three months that they are planning to stay in in Ireland. So it's not a not a short period of time. In one of the crafty moments in a, a Jane Austen book that just thrills me no end, Mr. Knightley sitting there talking with Mrs. Weston and Emma is putting buttons on his leather gaiters himself. This, I think 10 years ago, this would have flown right past me, but I, I love this. And so then I started thinking because I'm me, ooh, gaiters. I remember seeing like revolutionary war era uh, costumes, leggings that had what I always thought looked kind of strangely like spats, but I bet those were gaiters and they are. And then I looked up, what's the difference between a gaiter and a spat? And so I have this information for you now. Gaiters extended over the lower edge of the trouser and the top of the foot. So you could; these are the ones where you could see like a uh, strap go underneath the insole of the foot to keep them in place. This prevented from uh, you getting stockings messy or even the trousers that you'd be wearing. It would keep them from getting dirty around the ankles, which was not a bad thing to protect because it's a lot harder to clean fabric than it would be to brush dirt off of leather gaiters. But then spats only cover the instep and the ankle. And, and while we think of them as being very showy, they were also, again, easier to clean off than fabric. They protected your socks, both important, but they also and this is where gators also do the same job, protect water or snow from getting down in between your foot and your shoe. And boy, did Heather learn how important gators were walking around in blizzard depth snow in New York City. I had me some gators and they're awesome. Uh, but then it also, on this website that I found, has putties, P-U-T-T-E-E-S. Those are uh, the Luke Skywalker boots, the basically ace bandages around the top of the shoe and especially the ankle and then the the calf. This is World War I style. So there you go. Nightly starting the proud tradition of men carrying sewing kits with them everywhere they went. The Hussif. He He absolutely would have had a housewife or a Hussif. No question. In our third chapter today, so volume two, chapter 16 or chapter 34, uh, route cakes. So I've given you a link to some information on route cakes, including a uh, recipe that seems to be pretty much the recipe that has survived. Routes were kind of, I mean, I think of a route in like a military sense, which is true, but it was also more commonly used at this point to talk about a really big honk and crazy party, like one person at her county estate or her country estate. She invited 500 people over. And there was a joke going around at the time that a recipe for a route was to invite 100 people over, put them in your drawing room, stir, oh, with a low fire, stir, and let the scum rise to the top and then skim the scum. I've been to parties like that, haven't you? And so the the routes were that route cakes sound a little bit like um like drop scones. They they sound like little mini fruit cakes, but they are a kind of cake that was served at these kinds of parties, which could be scandalous, but weren't always. Ice, you're going to hear a reference to no ice at Highbury card parties, and this is uh, according to Mrs. Elton, scandalous. Mrs. Elton living in Bristol, there was a lot more ices, like gelato, ices, flavored ices, water ices, and ice cream. These were all things that happened easily in the cities where you could actually have a lot of places saving ice after the winter. If you were living on an estate or in a smaller place, access to a lot of ice might not be so common. So that's that's where her horror of 
what do you mean you don't have ice at parties? And she's talking about both ice ice and ice cream or cream ices or water ices. She'll also talk about when you have a card party, you are supposed to put a single candle on each table so everybody has enough light to play by, but also unbroken packs. So brand new packs of cards. Uh, unbroken mean the the cards aren't bent yet. They aren't they they haven't been softened up, so it's harder to shuffle them, which I like my broken in stacks of cards much better. Mr. Woodhouse, of course, if they were having a dinner party under normal circum- circumstances, and we talked about this before, Emma would be at the head of the table as she is the the lady of the house right now, and her father would slash could be at the foot of the table, but that would also mean that he had to carve the meat uh, often and wouldn't necessarily want to do that. So under normal circumstances, that was Mr. Knightley. He was at the foot of the table and Emma was at the head of the table. And that's just, that's just the way it went. If Mr. John Knightley were in town, he would be sitting at the other end of the table from Emma because he's the son-in-law. He's not just the beloved neighbor. He is Mr. Woodhouse's son-in-law and therefore he would have that honor. And it wouldn't be a, a question. That would just be the done thing. Not quite the thing. Somebody exhibiting philosophic composure, Stoics. They're being stoical about something. They're you know, being thoughtful, hmm, not being overly emotional. Between sense and sensibility, it's the sense side of things. You're going to hear some interesting, I think, interesting conversations about post offices. And, and there's the usual, yes, the post office was kind of the center of town society. Everybody had to go in there. Everybody had various things that they did at the post office. It wasn't just for posting. It, oftentimes, it was like the general store as well. But by the time the Napoleonic Wars happened, postage was impacted because of the war. And that also means that the post office fees had gone up. So in 1765, posting a letter to another town was sixpence. Not much. By the time 1812 rolls around and the the wars have been going on for a while, it was one shilling, two pence, which is why everybody wrote so much in every direction, as much as possible on any given sheet of paper. The reference to hands is not how many hands the letter goes through. It's hands as in, what does your handwriting look like? That's your hand, your shorthand uh, for handwriting. But conversations about paying for the post in these newer and more expensive times, this is a conversation about politics that everybody else reading this at that time would have been aware of. It's like the price of the post did not go up accidentally. The price of the post went up because we've been having wars. We've been paying a lot of money for wars and the postal service was impacted by, well, all the things that wind up impacting regular society when wars happen. In part because when post was 6p to send something, that was because that was the fee you were paying to have the delivery made. During the war, those deliveries became taxed, and that's where the the extra fees came from. Expeditious. If you listened to Prairie Home Companion, you know that Garrison Keillor used to talk about something being expeditious, something speedy. You will hear expedition used here. It still means speedy. And you're going to hear a a reference to the expense of the Irish males. Even though Ireland and England had been joined through the 1800 Acts of Union, their postal systems maintained separation. And so uh, Irish mail were getting mail to Ireland via both the English and the Irish postal systems. It would have been two different systems, so it would have been more money. And that is the end of what I need to tell you before we listen to the chapters. I know this has been a lot of information. There's so much going on in these chapters. And you may say to yourself, Heather, why did you pack three chapters together if they're going to be that hefty? And the answer is because 
there's a tonal shift that happens with our chapters next week. The tone for these three chapters match up beautifully. I, I couldn't not do all three of these together. They dovetail together too nicely to have separated them out. All right. So let's listen to volume two, chapters 14, 15, and 16, or chapters 32, 33, and 34, if you are listening to a book that numbers that way. And if you are listening to a different version of Jane Austen's Emma than the one that we are about to play for you now, you can fast wind to one hour, 46 minutes, 56 seconds. All right, here we go. Volume 2, Chapter 14 Mrs. Elton was first seen at church, but though devotion might be interrupted, curiosity could not be satisfied by a bride in a pew, and it must be left for the visits in form which were then to be paid, to settle whether she were very pretty indeed, or only rather pretty, or not pretty at all. Emma had feelings less of curiosity than of pride or propriety, to make her resolve on not being the last to pay her respects, and she made a point of Harriet's going with her, that the worst of the business might be gone through as soon as possible. She could not enter the house again, could not be in the same room to which she had with such vain artifice retreated three months ago, to lace up her boot, without recollecting. A thousand vexatious thoughts would recur— compliments, charades, and horrible blunders, and it was not to be supposed that poor Harriet should not be recollecting too, but she behaved very well, and was only rather pale and silent. The visit was, of course, short, and there was so much embarrassment and occupation of mind to shorten it, that Emma would not allow herself entirely to form an opinion of the lady, and on no account to give one, beyond the nothing-meaning terms of being elegantly dressed and very pleasing. She did not really like her. She would not be in a hurry to find fault, but she suspected that there was no elegance, ease, but not elegance. She was almost sure that for a young woman, a stranger, a bride, there was too much ease. Her person was rather good, her face not unpretty, but neither feature nor air nor voice nor manner were elegant. Emma thought at least it would turn out so. As for Mr. Elton, his manners did not appear—but no, she would not permit a hasty or a witty word from herself about his manners. It was an awkward ceremony at any time to be receiving wedding visits, and a man had need be all grace to acquit himself well through it. The woman was better off, she might have the assistance of fine clothes, and the privilege of bashfulness— but the man had only his own good sense to depend on, and when she considered how peculiarly unlucky poor Mr. Elton was in being in the same room at once with the woman he had just married, the woman he had wanted to marry, and the woman whom he had been expected to marry, she must allow him to have the right to look as little wise, and to be as much affectedly and as little really easy as could be. "'Well, Miss Woodhouse,' said Harriet, when they had quitted the house, and after waiting in vain for her friend to begin— "'Well, Miss Woodhouse,' with a gentle sigh, "'what do you think of her? Is not she very charming?' There was a little hesitation in Emma's answer. "'Oh, yes, very, a very pleasing young woman.' "'I think her beautiful, quite beautiful. Very nicely dressed, indeed, a remarkably elegant gown. I am not at all surprised that he should have fallen in love.' No, oh, no, there is nothing to surprise one at all. A pretty fortune, and she came in his way. I dare say, returned Harriet, sighing again, I dare say she was very much attached to him. Perhaps she might, but it is not every man's fate to marry the woman who loves him best. Miss Hawkins perhaps wanted a home, and thought this the very best offer she was likely to have. Yes, said Harriet earnestly, and well she might, nobody could ever have a better. Well, I wish them happy with all my heart. And now, Miss Woodhouse, I do not think I shall mind seeing them again. He is just as superior as ever. But being married, you know, it is quite a different thing. No, indeed, Miss Woodhouse, you need not be afraid. I can sit and admire him now without any great misery. To know that he has not thrown himself away is such a comfort. She does seem a charming young woman, just what he deserves. Happy creature! He called her Augusta. How delightful! 
When the visit was returned, Emma made up her mind. She could then see more and judge better. From Harriet's happening not to be at Hartfield and her father's being present to engage Mr. Elton, she had a quarter of an hour of the lady's conversation to herself, and could composedly attend to her. And the quarter of an hour quite convinced her that Mrs. Elton was a vain woman, extremely well satisfied with herself, and thinking much of her own importance, that she meant to shine and be very superior, but with manners which had been formed in a bad school pert and familiar, that all her notions were drawn from one set of people, and one style of living, that if not foolish she was ignorant, and that her society would certainly do Mr. Elton no good. Harriet would have been a better match. If not wise or refined herself, she would have connected him with those who were. But Miss Hawkins, it might be fairly supposed from her easy conceit, had been the best of her own set. The rich brother-in-law near Bristol was the pride of the alliance, and his place and his carriages were the pride of him. The very first subject, after being seated, was Maple Grove. "'My brother Mr. Suckling's seat,' a comparison of Hartfield to Maple Grove. The grounds of Hartfield were small, but neat and pretty, and the house was modern and well-built. Mrs. Elton seemed most favourably impressed by the size of the room, the entrance, and all that she could see or imagine. "'Very like Maple Grove, indeed. She was quite struck by the likeness. That room was the very shape and size of the morning-room at Maple Grove, her sister's favourite room,' Mr. Elton was appealed to. "'Was it not astonishingly like? She could really almost fancy herself at Maple Grove.' "'And the staircase. You know, as I came in, I observed how very like the staircase was, placed exactly in the same part of the house.' I really could not help exclaiming. I assure you, Miss Woodhouse, it is very delightful to me to be reminded of a place I am so extremely partial to as Maple Grove. I have spent so many happy months there, with a little sigh of sentiment. A charming place, undoubtedly. Everybody who sees it is struck by its beauty, but to me it has been quite a home. Whenever you are transplanted, like me, Miss Woodhouse, you will understand how very delightful it is to meet with anything at all like what one has left behind. I always say this is quite one of the evils of matrimony. Emma made as slight a reply as she could, but it was fully sufficient for Mrs. Elton, who only wanted to be talking herself. "'So extremely like Maple Grove, and it is not merely the house. The grounds, I assure you, as far as I could observe, are strikingly like. The laurels at Maple Grove are in the same profusion as here, and stand very much in the same way, just across the lawn. And I had a glimpse of a fine, large tree, with a bench round it, which put me so exactly in mind. My brother and sister will be enchanted with this place. People who have extensive grounds themselves are always always pleased with anything in the same style. Emma doubted the truth of this sentiment. She had a great idea that people who had extensive grounds themselves cared very little for extensive grounds of anybody else, but it was not worth while to attack an error so double-dyed, and therefore only said in reply, "'When you have seen more of this country, I am afraid you will think you have overrated Hartfield. Surrey is full of beauties.' "'Oh, yes, I am quite aware of that. It is the garden of England, you know. Surrey is the garden of England.' "'Yes, but we must not rest our claims on that distinction. Many counties, I believe, are called the garden of England, as well as Surrey.' "'No, I fancy not,' said Mrs. Elton, with a most satisfied smile. "'I never heard any county but Surrey called so.' Emma was silenced. "'My brother and sister have promised us a visit in the spring, or summer at farthest,' continued Mrs. Elton, "'and that will be our time for exploring. While they are with us, we shall explore a great deal, I dare say. They will have their barouche landau, of course, which holds four perfectly, and therefore, without saying anything of our carriage, we should be able to explore the different beauties extremely well. They would hardly come in their shares, I think, at that season of the year.' Indeed, when the time draws on, I shall decidedly recommend their bringing the barouche landau. It will be so very much preferable. When people come into a beautiful country of this sort, you know, Miss Woodhouse, one naturally wishes them to see as much as possible, and Mr. Suckling is extremely fond of exploring. We explored to King's Weston twice last summer, in that way most delightfully, just after their first having the barouche landau. 
"'You have many parties of that kind here, I suppose, Miss Woodhouse, every summer?' "'No, not immediately here. We are rather out of distance of the very striking beauties which attract the sort of parties you speak of, and we are a very quiet set of people, I believe, more disposed to stay at home than engage in schemes of pleasure.' "'Ah, there is nothing like staying at home for real comfort. Nobody can be more devoted to home than I am. I was quite a proverb for it at Maple Grove. Many a time has Selina said, when she has been going to Bristol, "'I really cannot get this girl to move from the house. I absolutely must go in by myself, though I hate being stuck up in the barouche landau without a companion.' But Augusta, I believe, with her own good will, would never stir beyond the park paling. Many a time has she said so, and yet I am no advocate for entire seclusion. I think, on the contrary, when people shut themselves up entirely from society, it is a very bad thing, and that it is much more advisable to mix in the world in a proper degree, without living in it either too much or too little. I perfectly understand your situation, however, Miss Woodhouse, looking towards Mr. Woodhouse. "'Your father's state of health must be a great drawback. Why does not he try Bath? Indeed he should. Let me recommend Bath to you. I assure you I have no doubt of its doing Mr. Woodhouse good.' My father tried it more than once, formally, but without receiving any benefit. And Mr. Perry, whose name I dare say is not unknown to you, does not conceive it would be at all more likely to be useful now. "'Ah, that's a great pity, for I assure you, Miss Woodhouse, when the waters do agree, it is quite wonderful the relief they give. In my bath life I have seen such instances of it, and it is so cheerful a place that it could not fail of being of use to Mr. Woodhouse's spirits, which I understand are sometimes much depressed. And as to its recommendations to you, I fancy I need not take much pains to dwell on them. The advantages of Bath to the young are pretty generally understood. It would be a charming introduction for you, who have lived so secluded a life, and I could immediately secure you some of the best society in the place. A line from me would bring you a little host of acquaintance, and my particular friend, Mrs. Partridge, the lady I have always resided with when in Bath, would be most happy to show you any attentions, and would be the very person for you to go into public with. It was as much as Emma could bear without being impolite. The idea of her being indebted to Mrs. Elton for what was called an introduction, of her going into public under the auspices of a friend of Mrs. Elton's, probably some vulgar, dashing widow, who, with the help of a boarder, just made a shift to live, the dignity of Miss Woodhouse of Hartfield was sunk indeed. She restrained herself, however, from any of the reproofs she could have given, and only thanked Mrs. Elton coolly. But their going to Bath was quite out of the question, and she was not perfectly convinced that the place might suit her better than her father. And then, to prevent farther outrage and indignation, changed the subject directly. "'I do not ask whether you are musical, Mrs. Elton. Upon these occasions a lady's character generally precedes her, and Highbury has long known that you are a superior performer.' Oh, no, indeed. I must protest against any such idea. A superior performer? Very far from it, I assure you. Consider from how partial a quarter your information came. I am dotingly fond of music, passionately fond, and my friends say I am not entirely devoid of taste, but as to anything else, upon my honour my performance is mediocre to the last degree. You, Miss Woodhouse, I well know, play delightfully. I assure you it has been the greatest satisfaction, comfort, and delight to me to hear what a musical society I am got into. I absolutely cannot do without music. It is a necessary of life to me, and having always been used to a very musical society, both at Maple Grove and in Bath, it would have been a most serious sacrifice. I honestly said as much to Mr. E. when he was speaking of my future home, and expressing his fears lest the retirement of it should be disagreeable, and the inferiority of the house, too, knowing what I had been accustomed to, of course he was not wholly without apprehension. When he was speaking of it in that way, I honestly said that the world I could give up—parties, balls, plays—for I had no fear of retirement. Blessed with so many resources within myself, the world was not necessary to me. I could do very well without it. To those who had no resources it was a different thing, but my resources made me quite independent, 
and as to smaller sized rooms than I had been used to, I really could not give it a thought. I hoped I was perfectly equal to any sacrifice of that description. Certainly I had been accustomed to every luxury at Maple Grove. But I did assure him that two carriages were not necessary to my happiness, nor were spacious apartments. But, said I, to be quite honest, I do not think I can live without something of a musical society. I condition for nothing else, but without music life would be a blank to me. We cannot suppose, said Emma, smiling, that Mr. Elton would hesitate to assure you of there being a very musical society in Highbury, and I hope you'll not find he has outstepped the truth more than may be pardoned, in consideration of the motive. No, indeed, I have no doubts at all on that head. I am delighted to find myself in such a circle. I hope we shall have many sweet little concerts together. I think, Miss Woodhouse, you and I must establish a musical club, and have regular weekly meetings at your house, or ours. Will not it be a good plan? If we exert ourselves, I think we shall not be long in want of allies. Something of that nature would be particularly desirable for me, as an inducement to keep me in practice. For married women, you know, there is a sad story against them in general. They are but too apt to give up music. But you, who are so extremely fond of it, there can be no danger, surely. I should hope not. But really, when I look around among my acquaintance, I tremble. Selina has entirely given up music, never touches the instrument, though she played sweetly. And the same may be said of Mrs. Jeffreys, Clara Partridge that was, and of the two Milmans, now Mrs. Bird and Mrs. James Cooper, and of more than I can enumerate. Upon my word, it is enough to put one in a fright. I used to be quite angry with Selina, but really I begin now to comprehend that a married woman has many things to call her attention. I believe I was half an hour this morning shut up with my housekeeper. But everything of that kind, said Emma, will soon be in so regular a train. Well, said Mrs. Elton, laughing, we shall see. Emma, finding her so determined upon neglecting her music, had nothing more to say, and after a moment's pause Mrs. Elton chose another subject. "'We have been calling at Randall's,' said she, "'and found them both at home, and very pleasant people they seem to be. I like them extremely. Mr. Weston seems an excellent creature, quite a first-rate favourite with me already, I assure you. And she appears so truly good. There is something so motherly and so kind-hearted about her, that it wins upon one directly. She was your governess, I think." Emma was almost too much astonished to answer, but Mrs. Elton hardly waited for the affirmative before she went on. Having understood as much, I was rather astonished to find her so very ladylike. But really she is quite the gentlewoman. "'Mrs. Weston's manners,' said Emma, "'were always particularly good. Their propriety, simplicity, and elegance would make them the safest model for any young woman. And who do you think came in while we were there? Emma was quite at a loss. The tone implied some old acquaintance, and how could she possibly guess? Knightley, continued Mrs. Elton, Knightley himself was not it lucky, for not being within when he called the other day, I had never seen him before. And, of course, as so particular a friend of Mr. E.'s, I had a great curiosity. My friend Knightley had been so often mentioned that I was really impatient to see him, and I must do my caro sposo the justice to say that he not be ashamed of his friend. Knightley is quite the gentleman. I like him very much. Decidedly, I think, a very gentlemanlike man. Happily, it was now time to be gone. They were off, and Emma could breathe. "'Insufferable woman!' was her immediate exclamation. "'Worse than I had supposed. Absolutely insufferable. Knightly! I could not have believed it. Knightly! Never seen him in her life before, and call him Knightly, and discover that he is a gentleman, a little upstart, vulgar being, with her Mr. E., and her caro sposo, and her resources, and all her airs of pert pretension and underbred finery, actually to discover that Mr. Knightley is a gentleman. I doubt whether he will return the compliment and discover her to be a lady. I could not have believed it, and to propose that she and I should unite to form a musical club. One would fancy we were bosom friends. 
and Mrs. Weston, astonished that the person who had brought me up should be a gentlewoman. Worse and worse! I never met with her equal. Much beyond my hopes, Harriet is disgraced by any comparison. Oh, what would Frank Churchill say to her if he were here? How angry and how diverted he would be! Ah, there I am, thinking of him directly, always the first person to be thought of. How I catch myself out! Frank Churchill comes as regularly into my mind. All this ran so glibly through her thoughts that by the time her father had arranged himself after the bustle of the Elton's departure, and was ready to speak, she was very tolerably capable of attending. "'Well, my dear,' he deliberately began, "'considering we never saw her before, she seems a very pretty sort of young lady, and I dare say she was much pleased with you. She speaks a little too quick, a little quickness of voice there is which rather hurts the ear. But I believe I am nice, I do not like strange voices, and nobody speaks like you and poor Miss Taylor. However, she seems a very obliging, pretty-behaved young lady, and no doubt will make him a very good wife. Though I think he had better not have married. I made the best excuses I could for not having been able to wait on him and Mrs. Elton on this happy occasion. I said that I hoped I should in the course of the summer. But I ought to have gone before. Not to wait upon a bride is very remiss. Oh, it shows what a sad invalid I am. But I do not like the corner into Vicarage Lane. I dare say your apologies were accepted, sir. Mr. Elton knows you. "'Yes, but a young lady, a bride. I ought to have paid my respects to her, if possible. It was being very deficient.' "'But, my dear papa, you are no friend to matrimony, and therefore why should you be so anxious to pay your respects to a bride? It ought to be no recommendation to you. It is encouraging people to marry if you make so much of them.' "'No, my dear, I never encouraged anybody to marry, but I would always wish to pay every proper attention to a lady, and a bride especially is never to be neglected. More is avowedly due to her. A bride, you know, my dear, is always the first in company. Let the others be who they may.' "'Well, papa, if this is not encouragement to marry, I do not know what is, and I should never have expected you to be lending your sanction to such vanity-baits for poor young ladies.' "'My dear, you do not understand me. This is a matter of mere common politeness and good breeding, and has nothing to do with any encouragement to people to marry.' Emma had done. Her father was growing nervous and could not understand her. Her mind returned to Mrs. Elton's offences, and long, very long, did they occupy her. End of chapter 14 Volume 2 Chapter 15 Emma was not required by any subsequent discovery to retract her ill opinion of Mrs. Elton. Her observation had been pretty correct. Such as Mrs. Elton appeared to her on this second interview, such she appeared whenever they met again, self-important, presuming, familiar, ignorant, and ill-bred. She had a little beauty and a little accomplishment, but so little judgment that she thought herself coming with superior knowledge of the world to enliven and improve a country neighborhood, and conceived Miss Hawkins to have held such a place in society as Mrs. Elton's consequence only could surpass. There was no reason to suppose Mr. Elton thought at all differently from his wife. He seemed not merely happy with her, but proud. He had the air of congratulating himself on having brought such a woman to Highbury as not even Miss Woodhouse could equal, and the greater part of her new acquaintance, disposed to commend, or not in the habit of judging, followed the lead of Miss Bates's good will, or taking it for granted that the bride must be as clever and as agreeable as she professed herself, were very well satisfied, so that Mrs. Elton's praise passed from one mouth to another as it ought to do, unimpeded by Miss Woodhouse who readily continued her first contribution, and talked with a very good grace of her being very pleasant and very elegantly dressed. In one respect Mrs. Elton grew even worse than she had at first appeared. Her feelings altered toward Emma. Offended, probably, by the little encouragement which her proposals of intimacy met with, she drew back in her turn, and gradually became much more cold and distant, and though the effect was agreeable, the ill-will which produced it was necessarily increasing Emma's dislike. Her manners, too, and Mr. Elton's, were unpleasant towards Harriet. They were sneering and negligent. 
Emma hoped it must rapidly work Harriet's cure, but the sensations which could prompt such behaviour sunk them both very much. It was not to be doubted that poor Harriet's attachment had been an offering to conjugal unreserve, and her own share in the story, under a colouring the least favourable to her and the most soothing to him, had in all likelihood been given also. She was, of course, the object of their joint dislike. When they had nothing else to say, it must be always easy to begin abusing Miss Woodhouse, and the enmity which they dared not show in open disrespect to her found a broader vent in contemptuous treatment of Harriet. Mrs. Elton took a great fancy to Jane Fairfax, and from the first. Not merely when a state of warfare with one young lady might be supposed to recommend the other, but from the very first, and she was not satisfied with expressing a natural and reasonable admiration, but without solicitation, or plea, or privilege, she must be wanting to assist and befriend her. Before Emma had forfeited her confidence, and about the third time of their meeting, she heard all Mrs. Elton's knight-errantry on the subject. "'Jane Fairfax is absolutely charming, Miss Woodhouse. I quite rave about Jane Fairfax. A sweet, interesting creature, so mild and ladylike, and with such talents. I assure you I think she has very extraordinary talents. I do not scruple to say that she plays extremely well. I know enough of music to speak decidedly on that point. Oh, she is absolutely charming.' You will laugh at my warmth, but upon my word I talk of nothing but Jane Fairfax, and her situation is so calculated to affect one. Miss Woodhouse, we must exert ourselves and endeavour to do something for her. We must bring her forward. Such talent as hers must not be suffered to remain unknown. I dare say you have heard those charming lines of the poet— Full many a flower is born to blush unseen, and waste its fragrance on the desert air. We must not allow them to be verified in sweet Jane Fairfax. I cannot think there is any danger of it, was Emma's calm answer. And when you are better acquainted with Miss Fairfax's situation, and understand what her home has been, with Colonel and Mrs. Campbell, I have no idea that you will suppose her talents can be unknown. Oh, but dear Miss Woodhouse, she is now in such retirement, such obscurity, so thrown away. Whatever advantages she may have enjoyed with the Campbells are so palpably at an end. And I think she feels it. I am sure she does. She is very timid and silent. One can see that she feels the want of encouragement. I like her the better for it. I must confess it is a recommendation to me. I am a great advocate for timidity, and I am sure one does not often meet with it. But in those who are at all inferior, it is extremely prepossessing. Oh, I assure you, Jane Fairfax is a very delightful character, and interests me more than I can express. You appear to feel a great deal— but I am not aware how you or any of Miss Fairfax's acquaintance here, any of those who have known her longer than yourself, can show her any other attention than, my dear Miss Woodhouse, a vast deal may be done by those who dare to act. You and I need not be afraid. If we set the example, many will follow it as far as they can, though all have not our situations. We have carriages to fetch and convey her home, and we live in a style which could not make the addition of Jane Fairfax at any time the least inconvenient. I should be extremely displeased if Wright were to send us up such a dinner as could make me regret having asked more than Jane Fairfax to partake of it. I have no idea of that sort of thing. It is not likely that I should, considering what I have been used to. My greatest danger, perhaps, in housekeeping may be quite the other way, in doing too much, and being too careless of expense. Maple Grove will probably be my model more than it ought to be, for we do not at all affect to equal my brother, Mr. Suckling, in income. However my resolution is taken as to noticing Jane Fairfax, I shall certainly have her very often at my house, shall introduce her wherever I can, shall have musical parties to draw out her talents, and shall be constantly on the watch for an eligible situation. My acquaintance is so very extensive, that I have little doubt of hearing of something to suit her shortly. I shall introduce her, of course, very particularly to my brother and sister when they come to us. I am sure they shall like her extremely, and when she gets a little acquainted with them, her fears will completely wear off, for there really is nothing in the manners of either but what is highly conciliating. 
I shall have her very often indeed while they are with me, and I dare say we shall sometimes find a seat for her in the barouche Landau, in some of our exploring parties. Poor Jane Fairfax, thought Emma, you have not deserved this. You may have done wrong with regard to Mr. Dixon, but this is a punishment beyond what you could have merited. The kindness and protection of Mrs. Elton. Jane Fairfax and Jane Fairfax. Heavens! Let me not suppose that she dares go about Emma Woodhousing me. But upon my honour, there seems no limit to the licentiousness of that woman's tongue. Emma had not to listen to such paradings again, to any so exclusively addressed to herself, so disgustingly decorated with a dear Miss Woodhouse. The change on Mrs. Elton's side soon afterwards appeared, and she was left in peace, neither forced to be the very particular friend of Mrs. Elton, nor, under Mrs. Elton's guidance, the very active patroness of Jane Fairfax, and only sharing with others in a general way, in knowing what was felt, what was mediated, what was done. She looked on with some amusement. Miss Bates's gratitude for Mrs. Elton's attentions to Jane was in the first style of guileless simplicity and warmth. She was quite one of her worthies, the most amiable, affable, delightful woman, just as accomplished and condescending as Mrs. Elton meant to be considered. Emma's only surprise was that Jane Fairfax should accept those attentions, and tolerate Mrs. Elton as she seemed to do. She heard of her walking with the Eltons, sitting with the Eltons, spending a day with the Eltons. This was astonishing. She could not have believed it possible that the taste or the pride of Miss Fairfax could endure such society and friendship as the vicarage had to offer. "'She is a riddle, quite a riddle,' said she. "'To choose to remain here month after month, under privations of every sort, and now to choose the mortification of Mrs. Elton's notice and the penury of her conversation, rather than return to the superior companions who have always loved her with such real generous affection. Jane had come to Highbury professedly for three months. The Campbells were gone to Ireland for three months, but now the Campbells had promised their daughter to stay at least till midsummer, and fresh invitations had arrived for her to join them there. According to Miss Bates, it came all from her, Mrs. Dixon had written most pressingly, would Jane but go, means were to be found, servants sent, friends contrived, no travelling difficulty allowed to exist. But still she had declined it. She must have some great motive, more powerful than appears, for refusing this invitation, was Emma's conclusion. She must be under some sort of penance, inflicted either by the Campbells or herself. There is great fear, great caution, great resolution somewhere— she is not to be with the Dixons. The decree is issued by somebody. But why must she consent to be with the Eltons? Here is quite a separate puzzle. Upon her speaking her wonder aloud on that part of the subject, before the few who knew her opinion of Mrs. Elton, Mrs. Weston ventured this apology for Jane. We cannot suppose that she has any great enjoyment at the vicarage, my dear Emma, but it is better than being always at home. Her aunt is a good creature, but as a constant companion must be very tiresome. We must consider what Miss Fairfax quits, before we condemn her taste for what she goes to. "'You are right, Mrs. Weston,' said Mr. Knightley warmly. "'Miss Fairfax is as capable as any of us of forming a just opinion of Mrs. Elton. Could she have chosen with whom to associate, she would not have chosen her. But,' with a reproachful smile at Emma, "'she receives attentions from Mrs. Elton, which nobody else pays her. Emma felt that Mrs. Weston was giving her a momentary glance, and she was herself struck by his warmth. With a faint blush, she presently replied, "'Such attentions as Mrs. Elton's, I should have imagined, would rather disgust than gratify Miss Fairfax. Mrs. Elton's invitations I should have imagined anything but inviting.' "'I should not wonder,' said Mrs. Weston, "'if Miss Fairfax would have been drawn on beyond her own inclination, by her aunt's eagerness in accepting Mrs. Elton's civilities for her.' Poor Miss Bates may very likely have committed her niece, and hurried her into a greater appearance of intimacy than her own good sense would have dictated, in spite of the very natural wish of a little change. Both felt rather anxious to hear him speak again, and after a few minutes' silence he said, "'Another thing must be taken into consideration, too. Mrs. Elton does not talk to Miss Fairfax as she speaks of her. We all know the difference between the pronouns he or she and thou, the plainest spoken amongst us. We all feel the influence of a something beyond common civility in our personal intercourse with each other, a something more early implanted. 
We cannot give anybody the disagreeable hint that we may have been very full of the hour before. We feel things differently. And besides the operation of this as a general principle, you may be sure that Miss Fairfax awes Mrs. Elton by her superiority both of mind and manner, and that face to face Mrs. Elton treats her with all the respect which she has a claim to. Such a woman as Jane Fairfax probably never fell in Mrs. Elton's way before, and no degree of vanity can prevent her acknowledging her own comparative littleness in action, if not in consciousness. "'I know how highly you think of Jane Fairfax,' said Emma. Little Henry was in her thoughts, and a mixture of alarm and delicacy made her irresolute what else to say. "'Yes,' he replied, "'anybody may know how highly I think of her.' "'And yet—' said Emma, beginning hastily and with an arch look, but soon stopping. It was better, however, to know the worst at once. She hurried on. "'And yet, perhaps, you may hardly be aware yourself how highly it is. The extent of your admiration may take you by surprise some day or other.' Mr. Knightley was hard at work upon the lower buttons of his thick leather gaiters, and either the exertion of getting them together, or some other cause, brought the colour into his face as he answered, "'Oh, are you there?' but you are miserably behind hand. Mr. Cole gave me a hint of it six weeks ago." He stopped. Emma felt her foot pressed by Mrs. Weston, and did not herself know what to think. In a moment he went on. "'That will never be, however, I can assure you. Miss Fairfax, I dare say, would not have me if I were to ask her, and I am very sure I shall never ask her.' Emma returned her friend's pressure with interest, and was pleased enough to exclaim, "'You are not vain, Mr. Knightley. I will say that for you." He seemed hardly to hear her. He was thoughtful, and in a manner which showed him not pleased, soon afterwards said, "'So you have been settling that I should marry Jane Fairfax?' "'No, indeed, I have not. You have scolded me too much for matchmaking to presume to take such a liberty with you. What I said just now meant nothing. One says those sorts of things, of course, without any idea of a serious meaning. Oh, no, upon my word, I have not the smallest wish for your marrying Jane Fairfax, or Jane anybody. You would not come in and sit with us in this comfortable way if you were married." Mr. Knightley was thoughtful again. The result of his reverie was, "'No, Emma, I do not think the extent of my admiration for her will ever take me by surprise. I never had a thought of her in that way, I assure you.' And soon afterwards, "'Jane Fairfax is a very charming young woman, but not even Jane Fairfax is perfect. She has a fault. She has not the open temper which a man would wish for in a wife." Emma could not but rejoice to hear that she had a fault. "'Well,' said she, "'and you soon silence Mr. Cole, I suppose?' "'Yes, very soon. He gave me a quiet hint. I told him he was mistaken. He asked my pardon and said no more. Cole does not want to be wiser or wittier than his neighbours. In that respect, how unlike dear Mrs. Elton, who wants to be wiser and wittier than all the world! I wonder how she speaks of the coals, and what she calls them. How can she find any appellation for them deep enough in familiar vulgarity? She calls you nightly. What can she do for Mr. Cole? And so I am not to be surprised that Jane Fairfax accepts her civilities and consents to be with her. Mrs. Weston, your argument weighs most with me. I can much more readily enter the temptation of getting away from Miss Bates than I can believe in the triumph of Miss Fairfax's mind over Mrs. Elton. I have no faith in Mrs. Elton's acknowledging herself the inferior in thought, word, or deed, or in her being under any restraint beyond her own scanty rule of good breeding. I cannot imagine that she will not be continually insulting her visitor with praise, encouragement, and offers of service, that she will not be continually detailing her magnificent intentions, from the procuring her a permanent situation, to the including her in those delightful exploring parties which are to take place in the barouche Landau." "'Jane Fairfax has feeling,' said Mr. Knightley. "'I do not accuse her of wanting feeling. Her sensibilities, I suspect, are strong, and her temper excellent in its power of forbearance, patience, self-control, but it wants openness. She is reserved, more reserved, I think, than she used to be, and I love an open temper. No, till Cole alluded to my supposed attachment, it had never entered my head. I saw Jane Fairfax and conversed with her, with admiration and pleasure always, but with no thought beyond. Well, Mrs. Weston? said Emma triumphantly when he left them. "'What do you say now to Mr. Knightley's marrying Jane Fairfax?' 
"'Why, really, dear Emma, I say that he is so very much occupied by the idea of not being in love with her, that I should not wonder if it were to end with his being so at last. Do not beat me.'" End of chapter 15 Volume 2 Chapter 16 Everybody in and about Highbury, who had ever visited Mr. Elton, was disposed to pay him attention on his marriage. Dinner parties and evening parties were made for him and his lady, and invitations flowed in so fast that she soon had the pleasure of apprehending they were never to have a disengaged day. "'I see how it is,' said she. "'I see what a life I am to lead among you. Upon my word we shall be absolutely dissipated. We really seem quite the fashion. If this is living in the country, it is nothing very formidable. From Monday next to Saturday, I assure you we have not a disengaged day. A woman with fewer resources than I have need not have been at a loss." No invitation came amiss to her. Her bath habits made evening parties perfectly natural to her, and Maple Grove had given her a taste for dinners. She was a little shocked at the want of two drawing-rooms, at the poor attempt at rout-cakes, and there being no ice in the Highbury card-parties. Mrs. Bates, Mrs. Perry, Mrs. Goddard, and others were a good deal behind hand in knowledge of the world, but she would soon show them how everything ought to be arranged. In the course of the spring she must return their civilities by one very superior party, in which her card-tables should be set out with their separate candles and unbroken packs in the true style, and more waiters engaged for the evening than their own establishment could furnish, to carry round the refreshments at exactly the proper hour and in the proper order. Emma, in the meanwhile, could not be satisfied without a dinner at Hartfield for the Eltons. They must not do less than others, or should be exposed to odious suspicions, and imagined capable of pitiful resentment. A dinner there must be. After Emma had talked about it for ten minutes, Mr. Woodhouse felt no unwillingness, and only made the usual stipulation of not sitting at the bottom of the table himself, with the usual regular difficulty of deciding who should do it for him. The persons to be invited required little thought. Besides the Eltons, it must be the Westons and Mr. Knightley. So far it was all, of course, and it was hardly less inevitable that poor little Harriet must be asked to make the eighth. But this invitation was not given with equal satisfaction, and on many accounts Emma was particularly pleased by Harriet's begging to be allowed to decline it. She would rather not be in his company more than she could help. She was not yet quite able to see him and his charming happy wife together, without feeling uncomfortable. If Miss Woodhouse would not be displeased, she would rather stay at home." It was precisely what Emma would have wished, had she deemed it possible enough for wishing. She was delighted with the fortitude of her little friend, for fortitude she knew it was in her to give up being in company and stay at home, and she could now invite the very person whom she really wanted to make the eighth, Jane Fairfax. Since her last conversation with Mrs. Weston and Mr. Knightley, she was more conscience-stricken about Jane Fairfax than she had often been. Mr. Knightley's words dwelt with her. He had said that Jane Fairfax received attentions from Mrs. Elton, which nobody else paid her. "'This is very true,' said she, "'at least as far as relates to me, which was all that was meant, and it is very shameful. Of the same age, and always knowing her, I ought to have been more her friend. She will never like me now. I have neglected her too long, but I will show her greater attention than I have done.' Every invitation was successful. They were all disengaged and all happy. The preparatory interest of this dinner, however, was not yet over. A circumstance rather unlucky occurred. The two eldest little Knightleys were engaged to pay their grandpapa and aunt a visit of some weeks in the spring, and their papa now proposed bringing them, and staying one whole day at Hartfield, which one day would be the very day of this party. His professional engagements did not allow of its being put off, but both father and daughter were disturbed by its happening so. Mr. Woodhouse considered eight persons at dinner together as the utmost that his nerves could bear, and here would be a ninth, and Emma apprehended it would be ninth very much out of humour at not being able to come even to Hartfield for forty-eight hours without falling in with a dinner-party. She comforted her father better than she could comfort herself, by representing that though he certainly would make them nine, yet he always said so little, that the increase of noise would be very immaterial. She thought it in reality a sad exchange for herself, to have him, with his grave looks and reluctant conversation, opposed to her instead of his brother. The event was more favourable to Mr. Woodhouse than to Emma. 
John Knightley came, but Mr. Weston was unexpectedly summoned to town and must be absent on the very day. He might be able to join them in the evening, but certainly not to dinner. Mr. Woodhouse was quite at ease, and the seeing him so, with the arrival of the little boys and the philosophic composure of her brother on hearing his fate, removed the chief of even Emma's vexation. The day came, the party were punctually assembled, and Mr. John Knightley seemed early to devote himself to the business of being agreeable. Instead of drawing his brother off to a window while they waited for dinner, he was talking to Miss Fairfax. Mrs. Elton, as elegant as lace and pearls could make her, he looked at in silence, wanting only to observe enough for Isabella's information. But Miss Fairfax was an old acquaintance and a quiet girl, and he could talk to her. He had met her before breakfast as he was returning from a walk with his little boys, when it had been just beginning to rain. It was natural to have some civil hopes on the subject, and he said, "'I hope you did not venture far, Miss Fairfax, this morning, or I am sure you must have been wet. We scarcely got home in time. I hope you turned directly.' "'I went only to the post-office,' said she, "'and reached home before the rain was much. It is my daily errand. I always fetch the letters when I am here. It saves trouble, and is a something to get me out. A walk before breakfast does me good.' "'Not a walk in the rain, I should imagine.' "'No.' but it did not absolutely rain when I set out. Mr. John Knightley smiled and replied, "'That is to say you chose to have your walk, for you were not six yards from your own door when I had the pleasure of meeting you, and Henry and John had seen more drops than they could count long before. The post-office has a great charm at one period of our lives. When you have lived to my age, you will begin to think letters are never worth going through the rain for.' There is a little blush, and then this answer. I must not hope to ever be situated as you are, in the midst of every dearest connection, and therefore I cannot expect that simply growing older should make me indifferent about letters. Indifferent? Oh, no, I never conceived you could become indifferent. Letters are no matter of indifference. They are generally a very positive curse. You are speaking of letters of business. Mine are letters of friendship. I have often thought them the worst of the two, replied he coolly. "'Business, you know, may bring money, but friendship hardly ever does.' "'Ah! <laughs> you are not serious now. I know Mr. John Knightley too well. I am very sure he understands the value of friendship as well as anybody. I can easily believe that letters are very little to you, much less than to me. But it is not your being ten years older than myself which makes the difference. It is not age, but situation. You have everybody dearest to you always at hand.' I probably never shall again, and therefore till I have outlived all my affections, a post-office, I think, must always have power to draw me out, in worse weather than to-day. "'When I talked of your being altered by time, by the progress of years,' said John Knightley, "'I meant to imply the change of situation which time usually brings. I consider one as including the other. Time will generally lessen the interest of every attachment not within the daily circle, but that is not the change I had in view for you.' As an old friend, you will allow me to hope, Miss Fairfax, that ten years hence you may have as many concentrated objects as I have." It was kindly said, and very far from giving offence. A pleasant thank you seemed meant to laugh it off, but a blush, a quivering lip, a tear in the eye showed that it was felt beyond a laugh. Her attention was now claimed by Mr. Woodhouse, who being, according to his custom on such occasions, making the circle of his guests, and paying his particular compliment to the ladies, was ending with her, and with all his mildest urbanity said, "'I am very sorry to hear, Miss Fairfax, of your being out this morning in the rain. Young ladies should take care of themselves. Young ladies are delicate plants. They should take care of their health and their complexion. My dear, did you change your stockings?' "'Yes, sir, I did indeed, and I am very much obliged by your kind solicitude about me.' "'My dear Miss Fairfax, young ladies are very sure to be cared for. I hope your good grandmamma and aunt are well. They are some of my very old friends. I wish that my health allowed me to be a better neighbour. You do us a great deal of honour to-day, I am sure. My daughter and I are both highly sensible of your goodness, and have the greatest satisfaction in seeing you at Hartfield." The kind-hearted, polite old man might then sit down and feel that he had done his duty, and made every fair lady welcome and easy. By this time the walk in the rain had reached Mrs. Elton, and her remonstrances now opened upon Jane. 
"'My dear Jane, what is this I hear? "'Going to the post-office in the rain? "'This must not be, I assure you. "'You sad girl, how could you do such a thing? "'It is a sign I was not there to take care of you.' "'Jane very patiently assured her "'that she had not caught any cold. "'Oh, do not tell me. "'You really are a very sad girl, "'and do not know how to take care of yourself. "'To the post-office, indeed. "'Mrs. Weston, did you ever hear the like? "'You and I must positively exert our authority.' "'My advice,' said Mrs. Weston, "'kindly and persuasively, "'I certainly do feel tempted to give. "'Miss Fairfax, you must not run such risks. "'Liable as you have been to severe colds, "'indeed you ought to be particularly careful.' especially at this time of year. The spring, I always think, requires more than common care. Better wait an hour or two, or even half a day for your letters, than run the risk of bringing on your cough again. Now, do you not feel that you had? Yes, I am sure you are much too reasonable. You look as if you would not do such a thing again. Oh, she shall not do such a thing again, eagerly rejoined Mrs. Elton. We will not allow her to do such a thing again and nodding significantly. "'There must be some arrangement made. There must indeed. I shall speak to Mr. E., the man who fetches our letters every morning. One of our men, I forget his name, shall inquire for yours too, and bring them to you. That will obviate all difficulties, you know, and from us I really think, my dear Jane, you can have no scruple to accept such an accommodation.' "'You are extremely kind,' said Jane. "'But I cannot give up my early walk. "'I am advised to be out of doors as much as I can. "'I must walk somewhere, and the post-office is an object, "'and upon my word I have scarcely ever had a bad morning before. "'My dear Jane, say no more about it. "'The thing is determined, that is,' laughing affectedly, "'as far as I can presume to determine anything "'without the concurrence of my lord and master.' "'You know, Mrs. Weston, you and I must be cautious about how we express ourselves. "'But I do flatter myself, my dear Jane, that my influence is not entirely worn out. "'If I meet with no insuperable difficulties, therefore, consider that point as settled.' "'Excuse me,' said Jane earnestly. "'I cannot by any means consent to such an arrangement, so needlessly troublesome to your servant.' If the errand were not a pleasure to me, it could be done, as it always is when I am not here, by my grandmamma's. Oh, my dear, but so much as Patty has to do, and it is a kindness to employ our men. Jane looked as if she did not mean to be conquered, but instead of answering, she began speaking again to Mr. John Knightley. The post-office is a wonderful establishment, said she. The regularity and dispatch of it, if one thinks of all that it has to do, and all that it does so well, it is really astonishing. It certainly is very well regulated. So seldom that any negligence or blunder appears, so seldom that a letter, among the thousands that are constantly passing about the kingdom, is even carried wrong, and not one in a million, I suppose, actually lost— and when one considers the variety of hands, and of bad hands, too, that are to be deciphered, it increases the wonder. The clerks grow expert from habit. They must begin with some quickness of sight and hand, and exercise improves them. If you want any farther explanation, continued he, smiling, they are paid for it. That is the key to a great deal of capacity. The public pays, and must be served well." The varieties of handwriting were farther talked of, and the usual observations made. "'I have heard it asserted,' said John Knightley, "'that the same sort of handwriting often prevails in a family, and where the same master teaches it is natural enough. But for that reason I should imagine the likeness must be chiefly confined to the females, for boys have very little teaching after an early age, and scramble into any hand they can get. Isabella and Emma, I think, do write very much alike. I have not always known their writing apart. "'Yes,' said his brother, hesitatingly. "'There is a likeness. I know what you mean. But Emma's hand is the strongest.' "'Isabella and Emma both write beautifully,' said Mr. Woodhouse, "'and always did. And so does poor Mrs. Weston,' with half a sigh and half a smile at her. "'I never saw any gentleman's handwriting.' Emma began, looking also at Mrs. Weston, but stopped on perceiving that Mrs. Weston was attending to some one else, and the pause gave her time to reflect. "'Now, how am I going to introduce him? 
Am I unequal to speaking his name at once before all these people? Is it necessary for me to use any roundabout phrase? Your Yorkshire friend, your correspondent in Yorkshire, that would be the way, I suppose, if I were very bad. No, I can pronounce his name without the smallest distress. I suddenly get better and better. Now for it. Mrs. Weston was disengaged, and Emma began again. Mr. Frank Churchill writes one of the best gentleman's hands I ever saw. "'I do not admire it,' said Mr. Knightley. "'It is too small. Wants strength. It is like a woman's writing.' This was not submitted to by either lady. They vindicated him against the base aspersion. "'No, it by no means wanted strength. It was not a large hand, but very clear and certainly strong. Had not Mrs. Weston any letter about her to produce?' No, she had heard from him very lately, but having answered the letter, had put it away. "'If we were in the other room,' said Emma, "'if I had my writing-desk, I am sure I could produce a specimen. I have a note of his. Do not you remember Mrs. Weston employing him to write for you one day?' He chose to say he was employed. "'Well, well, I have that note, and can show it after dinner to convince Mr. Knightley.' "'Oh, when a gallant young man like Mr. Frank Churchill,' said Mr. Knightley dryly, writes to a fair lady like Miss Woodhouse, he will, of course, put forth his best. Dinner was on table. Mrs. Elton, before she could be spoken to, was ready, and before Mr. Woodhouse had reached her with his request to be allowed to hand her into the dining-parlour, was saying, "'Must I go first? I really am ashamed of always leading the way.' Jane's solicitude about fetching her own letters had not escaped Emma. She had heard and seen it all, and felt some curiosity to know whether the wet walk of this morning had produced any. She suspected that it had, that it would not have been so resolutely encountered but in full expectation of hearing from some one very dear, and that it had not been in vain. She thought there was an air of greater happiness than usual, a glow both of complexion and spirits. She could have made an inquiry or two as to the expedition and the expense of the Irish mails. It was at her tongue's end, but she abstained. She was quite determined not to utter a word that should hurt Jane Fairfax's feelings, and they followed the other ladies out of the room, arm in arm, with an appearance of good will highly becoming to the beauty and grace of each. End of chapter 16 Okay, was that enough snark for you? I hope... I hope so. I hope you enjoyed it. Okay, there's a bunch of stuff that I didn't alert you to beforehand because I just, I, there were some things I just did not want to risk spoiling. One of those, though, was another moment of italicization that is in Emma's head. And it's at the beginning of our first chapter when she is thinking about uh, going to the vicarage, going to Mr. Elton's home. The last time she had been there, was when she did the whole, oh, let me lace up my boot trick, thinking that she was getting Elton and Harriet to hook up with each other. Here, she refers to that whole episode with such vain artifice, which she had had in retreating there three months ago to lace up her boot. And she couldn't think about his house without recollecting. And recollecting that is in italics. So it's not just, I remember and I'm embarrassed. It's, I am mortified looking back and remembering what I did, which is good. These are chapters where Emma has learned things. We can see that she has learned things when we get to Jane Fairfax, which is marvelous. One, one would only hope that we can all grow as quickly and, and improve ourselves as quickly as Emma is doing in the chapter so far. Once again, Emma is implying the belief, or, or maybe stating the belief that Mr. Elton married Augusta for money and Augusta was done waiting. And the way she says that is uh, she had a pretty fortune, semicolon, and she came in his way. He was ready to marry anyone with enough money, and she probably accepted out of desperation. Now, Harriet mentions how Mr. Elton had referred to his wife as Augusta. Again, these are things one must not do. It's lovely and generous that Harriet thinks that's charming, but it is incorrect. As far as societal norms and structures go, 
that was crossing a line. And it was probably Mr. Elton crossing that line on purpose. Mrs. Elton is crossing lines because she doesn't know there are any lines. Mr. Elton is probably crossing that line on purpose to make Harriet and Emma both feel bad because he's so familiar and so in love with his wife that he is foregoing all the ostentation of these standards and norms and also kind of digging it in. Like, you're not even important enough for me to drop the miss with you, both of you, which is like Mr. El. Uh, you saw that they their visiting was only a quarter of an hour, and everybody knew that they had to make these visits to each other's homes. It was a thing. Emma also has uh, one moment of snark early on that I thought was very subtle. Harriet would have been a better match, if not wise or refined herself. She would have connected him with those who were, which is Emma in her own going, that would be me. Harriet would have gotten him in good with my family and nightly. Maple Grove, for whatever reason, I cannot hear Mrs. Elton talking about Maple Grove and not think Tara from Gone with the Wind. I know it's not a plantation, but somehow it's not the House of Seven Gables. It's being treated as though it were a grand estate. And her her descriptions, her comparisons between Hartfield and the home in Maple Grove just are supposed to drive you nuts. They certainly drove me nuts. And in fact, you'll see a, a screenshot of text from the book with all of the punctuation where Mrs. Elton is making those, those connections. This is very like Maple Grove. Indeed, she was quite struck by the likeness that room was the very shape and size of the morning room at Maple Grove, her sister's favorite room. Now, all of that was in quotation marks. And then there's a double dash. Mr. Elton was appealed to, M dash, quotation marks again. Was it not astonishingly like? She could really almost fancy herself at Maple Grove. Again, some really beautiful fancy footwork here just using punctuation of Jane Austen letting us know she was quite struck by the likeness. That's how she sounded. She would never have said it that way. Mrs. Elton would have said, I'm very struck by the likeness. But Jane Austen is still putting it into quotation marks, letting us know this is Emma describing as close to verbatim as she can to us what Mrs. Elton sounded like. I just love that. And it's, boy, it's not easy to do, really. When you, whenever you are transplanted, like me, Miss Woodhouse, whenever you have to uproot yourself and go get married, like I've had to do, the sacrifice that I've had to make. Gag. Emma, Emma made as slight a reply as she could, but it was fully sufficient for Mrs. Elton, who only wanted to keep talking about herself. So all Emma has to do is say, uh-huh, that's nice, dear. And Mrs. Elton is just going to keep going and talking about herself. My brother and sister will be enchanted with this place. They will be enchanted with Hartfield. I'm sorry, when were you all invited? Woman, I mean, wow, wow. And then I loved, again, snark fast alert. Uh, people, this is Mrs. Elton, people who have extensive grounds themselves are always pleased with anything in the same style. Emma doubted the truth of this statement. She had a great idea that people who had extensive grounds themselves cared very little for the extensive grounds of anybody else, but it was not worthwhile to attack an error so double-dyed. This goes back to Jane Austen's family a war over gardens and home size. It's, they didn't necessarily appreciate that the other house had really nice gardens, too. They just cared about their own gardens. The rest of you can just bite me. <laughs> and then Surrey. Surrey is not, or at least at the time, was not referred to as the Garden of England. It was Kent. You've got several different Snarkfest styles going on here. There's the classy... Emma replies, when you've seen more of this country, this county, I'm afraid you will think you have overrated Hartfield. Surrey is full of beauties. This is gracious. 
this is lovely. Mrs. Elton, wrong, says, oh, I'm quite aware of that. It is the Garden of England, you know. Surrey is the Garden of England. And then Emma's trying to let her know, actually, many counties, I believe, are called the Garden of England as well as Surrey. Just trying to, like, put it out there, woman, cool it. You're wrong. Let this one go. And Mrs. Elton comes back, tacky. No, I fancy not, replied Mrs. Elton with a most satisfied smile. I never heard of any county but Surrey that was called so. Emma was silenced. Single sentence, its own paragraph. This goes back to the anti mame clip. And actually, I'm going to have Eric insert uh, a couple of bits from anti mame here before we go on. Because this competition between classy and tacky is not news. And it, it goes along with the money doesn't care who owns them. But, but there's something else that I think is really important that's going on here that actually doesn't have anything to do with money or class, the way that we tend to think about it. So I'm going to have Eric play you uh, a couple of clips when you're going to hear Gloria doing her Bunny Bixler ping pong tournament routine, but also a reference to people who are top drawer, people like us. And Auntie Mame's spectacular line, the Aryan from Darien Darian, Connecticut, the Aryan from Darian with braces on her brains. So just listen to the genius that is Rosalind Russell in this clip from Auntie Mame, not the musical, the movie. Uh, Mame, I brought you something. What is it, Lindsay? Now be careful, the ink's still wet. My book! Look, look, everybody, I'm in print, just like Edna Ferber. Annie Mame, uh -huh. you did it. I never knew you went on with it. Patrick, you had vision. The way he managed it, Mame, he's just like you. Oh, my little lifesaver, Patrick and Lindsay. Yeah, this has been a great day. Patrick, you old meanie, why didn't you tell me your aunt was literate? <laughs> Mame, am I mentioned in your book? Mentioned? You're exposed. <laughs> Let's drink a toast to Live, Live, Live by Mame Dennis Burnside. Well, step right up now, folks, and get your red hot chapters. <laughs> you know, I've been to so many wonderful parties here, Mame. Now I'm going to find out how they all ended. <laughs> hey, I forgot about that time we almost got caught in the speakeasy. I remember I was about ten then. <laughs> <laughs> and here's all about the roller skates and Uncle Bo. And that Christmas we were so broke. Patrick, my little Patrick. Miss Burnside, you could practically write a whole book about what happened to me. Well, I beg your pardon, Gloria? I said you could practically write a whole book about what happened to me. Oh, yeah. oh, thank you. Yes. Bunny Bixler and I were in the semifinals, the very semifinals, mind you, of the ping-pong tournament at the club. And this ghastly thing happened. We were both playing way over our heads, and the score was 29-28. And we had this really terrific volley, and I stepped back to get this really terrific shot. And I stepped on the ping pong ball. <laughs> oh, I just squashed it to bits. And then Bunny and I ran to the closet of the game room to get another ping pong ball, and the closet was locked. Imagine. <laughs> we had to call the whole thing off. Well, it was ghastly. Well, it was just ghastly. <laughs> so one of the things that I love about the section of Auntie Mame and the whole movie entirely, the story entirely, is the Mame has money. Mame has always had money and she's had money in a way that she didn't need to pay attention to the fact that she had money until she didn't. And that's why Patrick's comment about the Christmas that they were so broke being the thing that touched his heart, remembering, and the thing that made him realize that Gloria and the Upsons were not actually top drawer. There's a, a phrase that I know we've talked about a long time ago on Craftlet, noblesse oblige. It's the obligations of those who have the most to be supportive of and help those with the least. This is the the biblical care for the widows and orphans. It's it's the the Carnegies 
robber barons, you bet. Also, Carnegie Library, Carnegie Hall. These were places for everybody else to enjoy. Built of stone, built of marble. These are edifices and functional third spaces that have been around for a real long time now. And, and those kinds of things, whether it's Ben Franklin, lovely Quaker man with issues, but I'm sticking with the lovely Quaker man for now, setting up community volunteer fire departments and libraries, these kinds of things when you are lucky enough, because it is luck, when you're lucky enough to have been blessed by that kind of wealth, it's not enough to just say, thank God I'm rich. You need to take it the next step. Thank God making me rich enough to be able to help others. This is not just altruism to make yourself feel better. This is how society works. If we aren't all taking care of each other, we don't survive. The whole American, and I'm so sorry for it, the American West myth of the single lone cowboy saving a town single-handedly. Oh, no, 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 no. It was a society. Period. Part of all of this was it's a lot easier to maintain that when you have a smaller society, a smaller core group of people who are all going to the same post office, all walking down the streets with each other. Emma was walking down the same street as everybody else where the dog was fighting with another dog over a bone. They're all walking on the same street. It's, it's the corollary of everybody puts their pants on one leg at a time. I really think the classy versus tacky thing, the classy is I don't need to go out of my way to prove that I'm a good person. I do what I do the best that I can. I don't have money for new clothes. I maintain the clothes that I have with care and attention. This was a thing, I think I've mentioned this before. We had a, a theater professor who got really bad at some of our, our students, um, actually friends who did shows with Jack Black a lot. Um, Jack was not one of the people who got yelled at about this, though. They were doing some Sam Shepard play, and one of the guys did his scene, and he's supposed to look poor, backwoods kind of poor. And so he has on his torn Levi's. You know, we all we all worked in the shop. We all had Levi's that had no knees in them anymore. It's just occupational hazard. He got called out for that because, as the director said, if you were actually poor, your things may look shabby, but they would have lasted because you couldn't afford to buy new clothes. So you have your, your Sunday best, which you wear the least, but everything else is going to be carefully mended, patched. It's the, the Japanese sashiko, the beautiful stitching that was done. Again, poor, not a lot of clothes. So if you're going to have to mend them, mend them beautifully. All of that versus a very individualistic attitude. Some may say this is like early stage capitalism and now we're in late stage capitalism. That very individualized, individualistic, look at me, <laughs> she says while recording herself for YouTube. I get the irony here. But very much like, look at me, look at how fabulous I am. Look at all the good things I'm doing. I'm helping everybody. Aren't I wonderful? That kind of tackiness has nothing to do with how much money you have, right? It's like my, my students whose parents had come to the country uh, illegally and the children had been born here or some of them brought here as children and they were naturalized at some point. But their parents, in some cases, were still here without papers. But they had somehow managed to get a social security number so that they could work here legally, meaning they were paying taxes into the social security system that they were never going to be able to claim back because reasons they had a social security number that is not going to track when it comes down to get your benefits. I don't know how that stuff is working now, but that's how it was working then. And I was so impressed with these families 
where it was like, no, I'm, I'm an American. I've been here for 20 years. I have been paying taxes the whole time. I am proving to America that this is the country I am a part of. I see myself as part of. And that's classy. It, it isn't tied to money. I feel like I'm preaching. I need to stop. But I love getting these reminders of how society can function. And if you live, if you're lucky enough to live in a really nice neighborhood, and by nice, I mean nice people who know each other's names, who talk to each other, not nice like I have a McMansion that is 25 feet away from the next giant home and and nobody knows anybody else's name. People talked about that in Texas after there was that cold snap and and people died because the the grid went down. And there are all sorts of fingers to point for how that happened and why that happened. But those people died because they didn't know their neighbors and nobody checked on them. And that simply would not have been happening back at this time period. Obviously, the grid wouldn't have gone down, but people would have been checking on each other. The importance of the nice guy giving out basil plants at the store really, again, dovetailed nicely with these chapters for me this week. These were important for me. I was one of the angry, shocked, smiley faces that I drew in the margins was when Mrs. Elton talks about how Mr. Elton was worried about the retirement to Highbury, to the smaller town, was going to be disagreeable. And the inferiority of the house, too. Wow. Okay, number one, you're talking about your husband's home. Number two, we've already been inside it with Emma and Harriet. And it's small, but it's nice. And it's well cared for. And it's not that small. He can still have dinner parties. But wow. I mean, saying it at all, but saying it out loud as a new bride, as a new person in town, saying it in front of everybody. It's like, do you read the room? What a tin ear. Blah. And then adding, adding to that insult, saying, and then when I met Mrs. Weston, I was rather astonished to find her so very ladylike, but she is really quite the gentlewoman. Wow, you're saying this to Emma about her governess? Again, read the room. And it just underlines what Jane Fairfax is up against, that she comes across as very genteel, very reserved, very genteel, and she's going to have to be a governess, and this is how people are going to think about her. Like, oh, what a surprise. You poor woman. So I said there was something I was going to tell you more about the cara esposo. Cara esposo, the feminized version of my my loving spouse. The It's supposed to be my dear husband. Except when you say cara, it's feminized. One of the early editors of Jane Austen's works corrected that to cara esposo, that male masculinizing the whole phrase. And... There has evidently been a lot of discussion about this. This editor replaced the typo, saying, I will let you decide. I tend to agree with this other guy who thought that this was Jane Austen making a mistake. Saying caro sposo would have been tacky and cliched. Saying cara sposo would have been also exposing yourself as an idiot. So what some of these editors were saying is they thought Jane Austen was too dumb to realize that it was supposed to be caro sposo instead of cara sposo. And I don't buy that for a second. Jane Austen doesn't make mistakes. Not like this. That this is absolutely 100% a very specific piece of characterization that we're given. And in fact, I have a, a link to a video that I've had Eric put in the show notes of uh, a linguist who talks about pronouns. And of course, he's talking about pronouns in a very modern context. I love hearing from an actual expert about pronouns who says everybody who's talking about this right now has it wrong. Everybody is talking about it wrong because nobody else 
except the linguists who all go to the linguist conferences together, understand this. And after you listen to his his six points that he makes, it's hard to walk away from that video not going, wow, I just learned a dumpster load about this. Holy cow. And it feeds right into this masculine, feminine, cara, caro, sposa. I just think it's so useful to have an expert to listen to who knows what they're talking about when they talk about things that are very complicated and also fraught. It's um, nice to have somebody cut through all the crazy and and bring you back to, oh, well, that's why. That's why everybody is getting it wrong. There are lots of reasons why we're getting it wrong. Nobody's being stupid. Everybody, there are real reasons. But this was not a mistake. I will die on this hill. Jane Austen spelled it this way because Mrs. Elton is supposed to be both cliche ridden and not aware of her own shortcomings when it comes to her breadth and depth of knowledge. <laughs> and in fact, her airs of pretension and underbred finery. Emma, Emma does not rely on cliches. And I loved Mr. <laughs> Mr. Weston. A little quickness of voice there is, which rather hurts the ear. And again, he's very classy. By the end of his paragraph, he's like, well, I'm probably making too big a deal out of this. I'm I should have gone to visit her before. I know I should have. I don't want people to not think that I care. He's just so lovely. He can drive me crazy, but I, I love him. We know that he doesn't like it when people marry. But he's like, no, no, no. More is avowedly due to her. She deserves to have the bridal treatment for, for the first year she's considered a, a bride. And as you know, my dear, she's always the first in company. Let the others be as they may. And then Emma talking about the, the vanity baits for poor young ladies. When he says, my dear, you do not understand me. This is a matter of mere common politeness and good breeding. It has nothing to do with any encouragement to people to marry. Common politeness costs nothing. Good breeding luck of the draw. But also being well-bred can also have something to do with how you're trained, not just your bloodline, but what you were taught to pay attention to and care about. He's just an interesting character. Emma shows no sense of liking Mrs. Elton at all from the get-go, but she has the good graces to say in public that Mrs. Elton is very pleasant and very elegantly dressed, <laughs> damned with faint praise. This is and writing classes at university when if somebody wrote a, a play in playwriting class and you brought it in, you did a table read and everybody sat around and said, that's great. Is it at the end of class yet? Whereas if somebody came in with something really good, we would argue about it for hours because there was some meat there to argue about and to, to come up with different ideas and grow from. Also one way to write a college recommendation for a student who was not a good student. Mrs. Elton was a student in my class from October 2023 to June 2024, period. Respectfully, Heather Ordover. And that's the recommendation. It's damned with faint praise. I don't know if you caught it. She refers to Jane, Miss Elton refers to Jane Fairfax as Jane Fairfax, speaking to Emma who she then calls Miss Woodhouse immediately after. She knows she's supposed to use Miss. She doesn't, which makes Emma immediately think, oh my God, are you calling me Emma Woodhouse to other people? Like what? What? What are you thinking? Oh my God. <sighs> and her talking... Uh, Jane Fairfax, uh, Mrs. Elton says, she's very timid and silent. One can see that she feels the want of encouragement. I like her the better for it. I like the fact that she's weaker and timider than I am. I must confess, it is a recommendation to me. Blech. And then we shouldn't be afraid to move forward with helping her if we set the example, and that is in italics. And we live in a style which 
could not make the addition of Jane Fairfax at any time the least inconvenient. You know, we're in this together. We understand how to be rich, don't we? And her humble brag, it is not likely that I should, considering what I have been used to, how I was raised with money in the past. My greatest danger, perhaps, in housekeeping may be the other way, in doing too much and being too careless of expense. Maple Grove will probably be my model more than it ought to be, for we do not at all affect it equal my brother, Mr. Suckling, in income. Okay, that just hits tacky on so many levels. Talking about how much money you have, how much money you don't have, and humble bragging, I'm just, my biggest weakness is that I do too much for other people. Oh my God. And again, the other thing, the other point I wanted to make about this not having anything to do with money in class or the class structure in society, which is heavily based on money. Miss Bates proves that it is not all about money. Miss Bates may be somebody who just yammers all the time, but she is classy. And we've already seen that in very recent chapters, like people trusting her. Don't ask her to make the plans with you. Ask her if the plans have been made correctly. Ask her if we're leaving anybody out. Have we insulted anybody accidentally? Because she would recognize it. And she would understand her her place in this society would be to, as an older, mature woman, even though she's unmarried, to give advice when asked for and know what the right thing is. And to compare Miss Bates' annoying side with Mrs. Elton's annoying side, they are, you're comparing apples and footballs. It's just, they're not even in the same park. Oh. It also horrified me when Mrs. Elton was talking about introducing Jane Fairfax to her brother-in-law and sister. When she gets a little acquainted with them, her fears will completely wear off, for there really is nothing in the manners of either of them but what is highly conciliating. Her fears will not wear off. And right now, my biggest fear is that Mrs. Elton is going to try and get a job for Jane Fairfax with her brother and sister. And that, oh, poor Jane. God, it's just miserable. And in fact, the first thing, Emma's first thought, poor Jane Fairfax, you have not deserved this. And then when Emma says, let me not suppose that she dares to go about Emma Woodhousing me. That is actually how it is written. Emma Woodhouse dash ing me. This is actually a thing. This using the informal versus formal mode of address. Toye kwakun which I'm probably butchering. But this is literally, and this goes again back to the pronoun video that, I, that I'm sharing with you guys. This goes directly back to, in French, if you say tu, to an older person, someone who you're supposed to be treating with respect, instead of saying vous, this would be crossing that bridge, and you shouldn't. And this would be Emma Woodhousing Emma behind her back to other people. It's also interesting and important, I think, that Jane... Austin has Emma in this chapter very specifically citing Miss Bates as uh, appreciating the, the gratitude for the attention that Mrs. Elton is paying to Jane Fairfax, and that that gratitude is the first style of guileless simplicity and warmth. She was quite one of her worthies, the most amiable, affable, delighted woman. Just as accomplished and condescending meaning able to work up and down the societal ladder, as Mrs. Elton meant to be considered. Remember that praise from Emma. That matters. How she understands Miss Bates to function in their society. There are lots of conversations going on around uh, Miss Fairfax and getting letters and taking the time and trouble, even in iffy weather, to go out and, and pick up the post. These are foreshadowing statements, and they will all be answered before we finish the book, I promise, if you have not already read it before. Keep paying attention to those moments. They, they stack up. I also thought Mr. Knightley's, with a reproachful smile at Emma, I'm sure Jane Fairfax doesn't love Mrs. Elton, but nobody else is paying her these attentions. Emma. And it's like, oh, oh. 
I understand. And again, with the pronouns, Mrs. Elton does not talk to Miss Fairfax as she speaks of her. We all know the difference between the pronouns he or she and thou. The plainest spoken among us, we all feel the influence of a something. We all know that there is there is some level of respect that's being afforded by using the language correctly. And uh, there's a second video by the linguist talking about children's uh, acquisition of language. I also loved how honest Mr. Knightley is about not loving Jane Fairfax, respecting her, caring about her, absolutely, but very clearly not in love. And why? Because she has not the open temper which a man would wish for in a wife. She's just not open. She's very closed off. She's very re restrictive about her own behavior and taciturn. And Knightley is not interested. He clearly likes people more like Emma, who what you see is what you get. She's very polite the way she's supposed to be, but she also has opinions about things and she will let you know, especially if she is somebody who you've known for their whole life. Knightley also makes, I'm calling him Knightley now. Uh, he also makes the comment that uh, Jane Fairfax is more reserved, I think more than she used to be. And again, this is another one of those moments of foreshadowing that will, will come around. Uh, I also love that when Mr. Knightley leaves and Emma and Mrs. Weston are still talking, she's like, he may have just said that he doesn't love Jane Fairfax. That doesn't mean that he's not going to realize that he loves Jane Fairfax. Do not beat me. Don't think I'm beat. Don't think you've got me on this one, Missy. It may still work out in my favor. And again, oh my God, Augusta Elton, a woman with fewer resources than I have need not have been at a loss. Oh my God. Again, with the social norms and expectations, she's going to have to have a dinner party for the Eltons at Hartfield. She must not do less than others. That would be the Westons or the Coles. Or she should be exposed to the odious suspicions and imagined capable of a pitiful resentment. Odious suspicions that she and Elton had something going on and now Emma is unhappy about Elton being married, that she's jealous of Mrs. Elton's position, and her not having a dinner party is just resentment on her part. Can't can't let that happen, which means you're going to have to throw the party yourself. And, and Emma gets to invite Jane Fairfax, and this is great because Emma is recognizing the fact that they should have been better friends this whole time, and it, it's taken a Miss Elton, Mrs. Elton to point out the the details of her behavior having been not so great. I also really love Jane Fairfax's conversation with John Knightley about the post office and the importance of letters and the difference between business letters for him, which bring good news because they often bring money, and for her, letters from friends because they bring love. And she doesn't have a lot of love in her life surrounding her. And so letters Letters are going to always be important to her. And, and I thought that was kind of lovely. When John Knightley says, Miss Fairfax, uh, as an old friend, you will allow me to hope that 10 years hence, you may have as many concentrated objects as I have. You may have children as well. And, and of course, he's hoping that she grows up, gets married, has children. This is all the assumed happiest a woman could be, not recognizing the fact that having children is a lot of work and may not be what you're really good at. And this is where Mary Wollstonecraft's vindication of the rights of women really kicks in. Because as Jane Austen points out, that was kindly said and very far from giving offense. Jane did not take this the wrong way. But Jane Austen recognizes that you could take it in a way that it was not intended. This is not intended as a slight. This is John Knightley actually trying to be very kind. However, this is followed up by Mr. Woodhouse talking about, did you change your stockings? 
young ladies must take care of themselves. Young ladies are delicate plants. This is exactly where Mary Wollstonecraft's uh, essay kicks in women's delicacy. And here's a quote. I once knew a weak woman of fashion, she recounts, who was more than commonly proud of her delicacy and sensibility. She thought a distinguishing taste and puny appetite the height of all human perfection and acted accordingly. I have seen this weak, sophisticated being neglect all the duties of life, yet recline with self-complacency on a sofa and boast of her want of appetite as a proof of delicacy that extended to, or perhaps arose from, her exquisite sensibility, for it is difficult to render intelligible such ridiculous jargon. One point for Mary Wollstonecraft. And Jane Austen is absolutely aware of that essay and drawing on this kind of thinking. But she's also very careful to make it clear to us that John Knightley is not trying to be a putz. Mr. Woodhouse isn't either. He's just a generation earlier and older fashioned about all of this than even John Knightley is. And and I think uh, Wollstonecraft would even go further into spinning in her grave when Jane Fairfax is protesting that she has not caught any cold. And Mrs. Elton says, oh, do not tell me. You really are, and that's italicized. You really are a very sad girl and do not know how to take care of yourself. I'm sorry rude <laughs> to the post office indeed mrs weston did you ever hear the like you and i must positively exert our authority okay mrs weston agrees this was probably a dangerous move you know catching cold was a serious thing you don't want to get sick at this time and jane has definitely had times of looking frail and being weak but mrs weston ends with but i know you're much too reasonable to put yourself at risk right? And then Mrs. Elton cuts in with, oh, she shall not, italicized, do such a thing again. Like, what, are you going to body block her? Oh, no, it's worse. I'm going to send my man to pick up your letters for you. My man who, by the way, I can't be bothered to remember his name. Okay, we have spent, at this point, 335 pages of Mr. Woodhouse knowing all of his staff's names, getting the children of his staff good jobs nearby. And aside from Mrs. Soames, who he's never met in person and doesn't know how she's going to do at keeping you know the, the rooms clean enough at the, the Crown Inn for them to have a dance in, he knows everybody's name. He, he cares. I really do not like Mrs. Elton at all. Oh my God. I And some of me feels like Jane, is Jane Austen just front loading all of the most annoying Mrs. Elton things so that she can lighten up and not have Mrs. Elton destroy every scene that she is in by frustrating us? Yes, I think that is a lot of what she is doing. She is laying all of the characterization groundwork that we could possibly need in three chapters. Because she she cannot continue to be this horrible all the time. She can be more silent, but knowing that she is there and present, we know that this is what her attitude is going to be anytime she is talking to anybody else from Highbury. And then, God, there are more horrified, not smiley faces in the margins here. Without the concurrence of my lord and master, I can't determine anything myself. <laughs> I also thought I have a lot to learn from Jane Austen, specifically in this section, the way that Jane Fairfax refuses Mrs. Elton's help is totally classy. I need to learn from this, where Jane says earnestly, excuse me, I cannot by any means consent to such an arrangement. So needlessly troublesome to your servant. If the errand were not a pleasure to me, it could be done as it always is when I am not here, by my grandmama's servant. I don't have to go to the post office. I want to go to the post office. I can't consent to such an arrangement. Not, you can't do that, 
or you can't force me, you can't make me, but I can't consent to this. This is improper. And then, oh my dear, but so much as Patty has to do, exclamation point, and it is a kindness to employ our men. Let's make our servants do more, shall we? Because they're men, I guess. Jane looked as if she did not mean to be conquered. But instead of answering, she began speaking to Mr. Knightley. It's just one of those moments of, this is a battle I am not going to win. Mr. John Knightley, how nice it is to see you and how nice it is to talk about post offices with you. It's just classy on Jane Fairfax's part. Like, I, I'm not going to fight you. I am not going to get into this with you. I am, instead of changing the subject, I'm actually going to change who I am focused on talking to in our little circle as we're all talking. I also love that when they're talking about handwriting, uh, and Emma brings up Frank Churchill, Mr. Knightley, oh, what a gallant young man like Mr. Frank Churchill, he said dryly. He writes to a fair lady like Miss Woodhouse. He will, of course, put forth his best handwriting put forth his best, and he's talking about the handwriting. Dinner was on the table. Mrs. Elton, before she could be spoken to, was ready, semicolon, and before Mr. Woodhouse had reached her with his request to be allowed to hand her into the dining parlor, she was saying out loud, in front of God and everybody, must I go first? I am really ashamed of always leading the way. Which was a, a lovely thing done for a bride, no matter whose home she was in. The host of that dinner party would walk the bride in as a matter of respect. But before he could even get out of his chair and ask her, because you have to wait to be asked, even if that's the tradition, it's just polite to wait to be asked. Must I go first? Well, God, I wish not, but yes, I guess so. Jane Fairfax has said more in today's chapters than she has in the entire rest of the book. I may be wrong on that, but I really feel like we've seen more of Miss Fairfax here than we have before. I could be wrong. But I'm a shut up now. I'm going to go lie down. You go have a good day, and I will talk to you soon. Have a great one. Bye. If you like what we do here, please consider liking and subscribing on iTunes, thumbs upping and subscribing on YouTube. You can visit patreon.com slash craftlit and become a patron of this art. And you can always go to Linktree, L-I-N-K-T-R dot E-E slash craftlit channel. And from there, you can get links out to all of the social media, all of the places that craftlit lives. It's it's a nice hub that you can go to to get all the stuff, all the good stuff. And I keep forgetting to mention, we also have a Facebook group with the loveliest group of people, as you might imagine. They're just awesome, makers and readers. And people who hadn't been readers before, but are now. I like that. All right. You take care of yourself. Have a great one. I'll talk to you soon. Bye.